86-18. This is the second proposed reg on opportunity zones, and it was published in the Federal Register on May 1st. We appreciate you all coming, uh, traveling to New Carrollton. This is uh, new for us at the Office of Chief Counsel. Most of our public hearings are held in our building downtown. But we had such an overwhelming um, group. We had a lot of people come for the first NPRM. So we would um, have NPRM. This is what New Carrollton holds for us. Um, so I'm going to start with introductions for the panel. Um, First, to my far right, we have Shereen Flance. She's a senior techni technician reviewer from ITNA, and she will be our clock keeper today. Then we have Sonia Kotari, a general attorney from um, Pass-Throughs and Special Industries. And right to my direct right is Robert Serkovich, special, special counsel to the Associate Chief Counsel of PSI. <coughs> to my left, we have uh, Michael Novi, one of our treasury representatives on the panel. He is the Associate Legislative Counsel, Associate Tax Legislative Counsel, the Office of Tax Policy with the Department of Treasury. To his left is Brian Rimke, who's the Attorney Advisor and another Treasury Representative. He's from the same office as Mike, Office of, uh, oh, the Office of Tax Legislative Counsel. I'm sorry, Brian, I have a different <laughs> Department of Treasury. Oh, we're all, we're all, we're all, <laughs> all from the Department of Treasury. All of tax policy. Yeah. <laughs> and then down at the far left is Russell Jones, who's the Special Counsel to the Associate Chief Counsel for Corporate. So once again, thank you so much for traveling up here. Uh, there's a lot of energy behind this statute. It's a very exciting new area of the tax law. And we appreciate all your help to getting to the right place for these regulations. We have reviewed and all the written comments that have been submitted, and we thank you for those comments. Um, today we have 19 speakers, a lot of 10 minutes each with possible follow-on questions from our panel. Um, also, this hearing is being recorded. Um, so the, for all the speakers that are here today, the black box on the lectern will be green while you are speaking. A yellow light will turn on when you have two minutes left, and then a red light uh, will come on at exactly 10 minutes. We ask that you stay within your time limit so we don't have to bring out the hook. That will be Shereen's job. <laughs> but we want to hear from everyone who has asked to speak. And uh, if we have time at the end, we will open up um, the mics that are out in the audience for anybody who else who has comments. Uh, we plan on breaking around noontime for lunch. It depends on where we're at with speakers, so but around noontime. Um, you will need, so the lunchroom is actually, if you go out the doors to where you came in with security, there's an escalator that takes you up to the next floor, and the lunchroom is to the left. Um, and you will need escorts to go into the lunchroom. And we have some in the back, in the lobby back there. Um, restrooms are out the doors, so the auditorium doors, to the left. It's a, it's a little hallway to the left. And, uh, the restrooms are down there. Um, we will call the speakers up in order on our list of speakers, but if there, uh, if someone is late or is, um, and then just a reminder, please put all your cell phone phones on mute. And uh, there is no food or uh, drinks in the auditorium, um, but they are allowing water today because they expect us to go for a long time. Um, okay. So, Mike, did you want to have a comment? Yes. First, thank you for, for sacrificing your time and convenience uh, to come here to help us. Uh, uh, as I was walking in uh, down the aisle, I overheard a couple of people saying that uh, uh, rake hearings like this one would be much better if there were some musical interlude between the speakers. <laughs> <laughs> And I began wondering, well, what, what would be the most appropriate music? And I think from our perspective, it would be that we can get by only with a little help from our friends. <laughs> and in this respect, you all are our friends. Uh, because you are here to give us some recommendations, I want to start off with a 
few recommendations about how you can be most helpful to us since clearly that is why you went to the trouble to get here. Uh, and this is particularly uh, important in light of uh, Shireen's uh, anticipated uh, draconian employment of the uh, time. One, uh, we are governed by the language that Congress enacted and the President signed. Uh, as a matter of uh, human interest, we understand many people's frustration and disposition with certain aspects uh, of the language that's there. But we are not legislators. And any use of your time uh, to describe how we should do something that really isn't in the statute, even if it's consistent with your perception of the statute's purpose, will be interesting, but it won't help us to write the reg. Second, your presence here and your interest in our regulations are all the credentials that you need for us to take your comments seriously. Uh, any more than a one sentence introductory description of yourself and your organization is using up time that would be better spent from our perspective uh, telling us what we ought to do. Uh, many of your written comments, in fact, provide uh, very impressive backgrounds, personal CVs, uh, institutional descriptions, we've got those. And if you can use your precious 10 minutes to tell us what we ought to do, that's much better. Your being here is enough for us to take you seriously. And then finally, if you can, please try to be concrete. Uh, if we should clarify something, and I'm sure there are of all the comments that we're getting, I suspect the, the largest single comment is, please ca please clarify X. Uh, give us an example. Tell us what a clarification would look like, even if it's not the best one, even if we could come up with something better than that after a while. <coughs> it is much better than saying, please clarify it, and we are left saying, well, we knew that. Clear. We had, the, you know, if, if we had known how to clarify it, we might have done it back, you know, back when we published the notice. So, if you can be concrete, that is one of the most helpful things you can do. Thank you for your time and effort. We're all ears. Okay, so let's start with the speakers. And I apologize uh, now if I mess anybody's name up, but uh, we're going to start with William Cunningham, who is representing himself. Well, good morning. Is the say on? Outstanding. So I'm Bill Cunningham. I'm actually here representing Creative Investment Research, which is a company I've run for about 25 years. If you want to follow along with my comments, go to creativeinvest.com slash oz.pdf creativeinvest.com slash oz.pdf is where uh, this uh, presentation is. Now, I'm going to talk about, I testified at the first hearing that you had. Uh, thank you very much for doing that. By the way, I know this is hard work. I really do. Uh, dealing with the public. I deal with the public all the time. Public is tough to deal with these days, you know. So I appreciate your, uh, 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 your efforts uh, in this area, especially with a program as important as this. Now, as you know, our concerns are that the Opportunity Zone program seems to allow people with significant capital gains a way to escape their responsibility for paying taxes. And it allows mainly white and wealthy taxpayers to avoid their social responsibility in exchange for investments via qualified opportunity funds in 8,700 poor communities, mainly black and Hispanic communities. So. Our economic analysis leads us to believe that the program is fundamentally unfair and fiscally unsound. We conducted a survey on the Opportunity Zone program to ask a couple of questions. We wanted to find out if people thought that the Opportunity Zone program favored the wealthy, favored the poor, or was neutral. 
Based on our survey, 44.74% of the people that responded thought that the program favored the wealthy, 5.26% concluded that the program favored the poor, and 50% actually indicated that they thought the program was neutral. Now, in terms of the impact, the social impact, what we do is we create impact investments. That's what we've been doing for the past 25 years. And in terms of the impact, projected impact of the Opportunity Zone on communities, according to our survey, 68.42% of the people that responded thought that the Opportunity Zone program would increase gentrification, 10.53% thought that it would decrease gentrification, and 21.05% thought that the program would have no effect on gentrification in those 8,700 uh, communities. Now, as we testified last time, part of the issue is that the assumptions concerning the Opportunity Zone program are very much like the assumptions that we see being utilized to justify programs that take economic resources out of black and brown communities. We've seen this most recently with the new introduction of a cryptocurrency called Libra. Facebook is positioning this currency as something that they're going to use to provide banking services to 1.7 bill. Now, look, it's about shareholder wealth maximization. It's about control. So it is with the Opportunity Zone program. Marketed as a program that's going to bring economic development to black and brown communities, we know, we know, based on the history of other programs, like the New Market Tax Credit program, like the CRA programs, we know that these programs have a tendency to reduce economic opportunity for black and brown people that were resident in those geographic areas prior to the introduction of these programs. If you don't believe me, look at 14th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C. That's all you have to do. So we're concerned about the negative externalities that uh, a program like this will impose on black and brown people in the 8,700 uh, communities. Now, we also know that a program like this diverts needed tax revenue from public programs to private purposes. We know that in places like California, there's a massive need for investment in infrastructure to deal with climate change. We know that in Illinois, there's a need for police and community development in minority communities. Taking money away from the federal treasury will not help these regions provide the services that those communities need. We know that in the state of Texas, there's a massive need for integrating new populations into the state. And we know that in New York, there are infrastructure and social needs that are critical, especially in light of the reversal of certain private companies from coming into certain parts of the state. I'm talking about Amazon. Now, our suggestions are twofold. The first is, and I understand this may be something that you cannot regulate, but our first suggestion would be that you be very clear that there's to be no benefit to the president, to senators, to congressmen, to state governors, and to others who had a hand in selecting those 8,700 communities. No benefit personally from investments that they hold in those communities. The second recommendation that we made was that you use something called Ethereum, the Ethereum blockchain. Blockchain technology is basically a distributed public database that is hard to manipulate. That you basically use this new technology to report on Opportunity Zone investment social impact. And we've outlined an impact measurement uh, strategy that would basically allow you to collect and analyze impact data, to evaluate the data, and then to possibly, and, and again, this is beyond your capability, but what we would like to see is we would like to see the social impact data used to calibrate the tax credit. You want to put a, a, a liquor store in Anacostia using the Opportunity Zone tax credit. The rules say that these types of sin businesses are not allowed. 
But we know that the second tranche of the regulations actually provide a safe harbor where there are going to be companies that utilize, that are able to put in SIN businesses in opportunity zone communities. If you don't believe me, there was an opportunity zone podcast uh, that I'm happy to send you that outlined exactly how that would work. So what we'd like to see is we'd like to see the opportunity zone tax credit calibrated to the social impact of the business. So that if you put affordable housing in Anacostia, you should get the entire tax credit, no question about it. You put a liquor store in Anacostia, you should get 5% of the tax credit. Some type of calibration that measures social impact and reduces or increases the tax benefit accordingly. Now again, complicated, hard to do, but we know that there are certain entities, Beak Center at Georgetown University, interest of full disclosure, uh, I'm a member of the faculty at Georgetown. Uh, I have nothing to do with the Beak Center's social impact uh, methodology as it relates to opportunity zones, but I'm simply pointing out that there is one and it could be utilized to do exactly what I've just suggested in the interest of specificity, I guess. Uh, so those would be our, our main recommendations. If you look at the presentation, again, creativeinvest.com slash oz.pdf. At the end of the presentation, you will see a social cost calculation mock-up. Oh, this thing is moving, I don't wanna, I don't wanna you know, fall off the stage here. But you'll see a social cost mock-up that is basically our idea as to how you would take the social impact data from that Ethereum blockchain that we suggested and put it into a dashboard that anybody could utilize to see what the social impact of Opportunity Zone investments are. Now, this is something, again, I don't know how you would regulate that. I really don't, you know, uh, but I know that it's doable. I know that the technology that has been developed now allows you to do things which you could not do 20 years ago. And I'm suggesting you use it for this purpose. So I think that about covers my uh, comments. Any questions? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Our next speaker is Mary Scott Hardwick from the Opportunity Finance Network. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mary Scott Hardwick. I work with Opportunity Finance Network, which is a national trade association of community development finance institutions. We have 270 members and we are a CDFI ourselves as well. Um, collectively, our members have provided over 65 billion in responsible lending to disinvested communities throughout the country. Um, so we are excited about the chance for additional capital to flow into these communities, but are concerned um, about whether proper regulations have been written to ensure that the benefits flow through to the communities and to the residents of those communities. Um, in order to do that, we have three areas that I'm gonna to cover today. First, reporting requirements, anti-fraud and anti-abuse provisions, and then finally, um, ensuring investment in operating businesses. So first, on the reporting requirements, uh, OFN is supportive of the Opportunity Zones framework that was developed by the Beck Center and the U.S. Impact Investing Alliance, um, and we support transaction-level reporting requirements with impact measurements, and making that data publicly available at least once a year. Um, this will allow communities to see what's going on, what sort of investments are being made, evaluations to be made of the program to ensure that it is worth the tax benefit um, or the tax loss that is occurring. Um, and it will allow people to compare zones to see if rural areas are seeing more investment or urban areas or how the program is working and where it may need to be tweaked in the future. Um, we also believe that reporting requirements are one of the best ways to deter fraud and abuse. If people know that they're going to have to submit you know, transaction level data, they need to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, in addition, on the anti-abuse provisions, um, we have a couple of places that do need to be clarified. Uh, the first is the improvements 
for vacant land when it is acquired. <laughs> Currently, the regulations state that it doesn't need to be substantially improved, but in a different area, it talks about how it needs to be more than insubstantially improved. So that's pretty confusing for someone trying to figure that out. Um, so for example, we would you know, want to make sure that if somebody acquires 50 acres of land, that they're not putting some small, minimally impactful commercial development on a quarter acre and saying that they've improved the land enough. Um, if you're acquiring large pieces of property, there needs to be a threshold for how much you need to improve it, and having that clarity will help investors move forward. Um, the conference report that passed with HR1 indicates that um, certification for funds should be similar to the New Markets Tax Credit Program, and we support that, including adding things that are required in the New Markets Tax Credit Program, such as having fund managers certify that they haven't been convicted of certain financial crimes within the past three years. We think that's a common sense check that's already in other Treasury regulations for similar programs, and we would support adding that. Um, we also suggest extending the ban on SIN businesses, not just for opportunity funds, but to qualified opportunity zone businesses. Currently, a fund can't invest in a SIN business, but the qualified opportunity zone business does not have the same um, restriction on it, so that creates a loophole for somebody being able to pass through um, funding there. So we would encourage you to clarify that and make it uniform across the board. Um, finally, uh, we are looking for some additional clarity around the reasonable cause for a fund to fail a 90% asset test. Um, I think there's concern that you know it could be too broad and people would be not making those investments, or if it's too narrow, you would have people who are unwilling to maybe make a riskier investment in a low-income community um, because they're scared they may fail a 90% asset test if a business plan falls apart or something like that. Um, so it would be very helpful to have clear definitions of what reasonable cause is and how a fund would meet that 90% um, Finally, we would like to thank Treasury and the IRS for this set of regulations for providing a lot more information about investing in operating businesses. Uh, we believe that job creation is the only way that this is going to provide true economic benefit. Um, so we are encouraged that um, those pieces are in there. Uh, we are a member of the Economic Innovations Group Opportunity Zones uh, Working Group, which they're going to be testifying later, and we support the recommendations in their letter, and we're a co-signatory of their letter. Um, with recommendations on how to improve it for operating businesses. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to talk today. Uh, panel, do you have any questions? And, and I apologize because I didn't ask the panel for questions for Mr. Cunningham. So Mr. Cunningham, we'll wait to the end and if anybody has a question for him, we can ask them. Does anybody have any questions? I have one. Okay. Do you, so your the vacant land rule. Yes. Do you have a number in your head for a threshold? I don't have a number in my head, um, but I believe it does need to be more clearly defined. If we, yeah. if we had come up with it, we would have put it in the proposal. <laughs> <laughs> um, the proposal that you mentioned from the regarding the certification, um, and there are, for a variety of arcane or procedural aspects of Senate process, uh, the statute has changed between mm -hmm. that time and the time it's enacted. But uh, how much time between the submission for certification and receipt of certification would you anticipate? Uh, would be a tolerable delay for qualified opportunity funds. And if there were as, as few as one per zone, we're talking about staffing over 8,700 uh, hands-on certifications. Is, is that really consistent with the speed and flexibility that Congress appears to have desired? 
we believe, and from reading the conference report and talking to members on the Hill, that they do support having certification in there. Um, I, I don't have an many, exact many, number for so, exactly. How, how many FTEs per certification? I would not know that. I don't. I mean, I get, what I'm saying is that we we also read that legislative history, mm -hmm. and uh, had been said you must send something in to an office uh, like the CDFI, mm -hmm. and we need to wait until certification comes back. Uh, that would have been consistent with the legislative history. It would have been highly problematic with respect to the uh, structure of the statute with its uh, stress on flexibility and rapidity. I agree that it would take additional resources in order to do that. Um, the position of our organization is that it's worth that investment and time. So, but with our current resources, should we simply slow things down in order to have certification? I believe that the Treasury has found a way to do it with several other programs, and I would encourage you to do as much as you can. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kevin Matz from the American College of Trust and State Council. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Good morning. Kevin Matz, I'm a tax trust and state lawyer, and also CPA, I'm part of the uh, Strip Law Firm in New York City. I'm speaking on behalf of the American College of Trust and State Council on trust and state specific issues uh, under the proposed regulations. Uh, in our comment letter, we identified five just for uh, to move things along. I want to start with the second one, but just very briefly by way of background. Again, we're talking about a trio of benefits, three different benefits to investors by investing in the program. Number one, they get a chance to defer capital gains until the earlier to occur under the statute of sale or exchange of the interest in the Qualified Opportunity Fund. Again, they have to invest in the Qualified Opportunity Fund within 180 days of that, or deemed 180 days. Uh, or the outside date, which is December 31, 2026. So sale or exchange, or December 31, 2026, whichever comes first according to the statute, that's a trigger point for an inclusion event. Uh, second benefit to be derived, so you have tax deferral, you could possibly, through basis adjustments, eliminate up to 15% of the capital gain. Uh, if you hold the interest in the Qualified Opportunity Fund for five years, you get a 10% basis step up. If you hold it for seven years, you get 5% on top of that. Uh, so that's 15% in total that could be eliminated. And then thirdly, the Troika, uh, the Troika benefits. Uh, if you happen to have the investment in the Qualified Opportunity Fund, including tacking by virtue of someone dying and, and, and the like, um, and you get to 10 years, and there's subsequent appreciation value the interest goes up in value, then that appreciation is completely tax-free. So what are some of the issues that are presented in the trust and states field? I'm actually going to go to point two, because I think that I, I think in terms of trust and states means people buy taxes, but they also can make gifts. You can have lifetime transfers. So what happens if you have a gift and interest in a qualified opportunity fund? My thought when I was reading the statute was, well, the statute talks about what's the triggering event. Sale or exchange, or December 31, 2026, is a gift to sale or exchange. The answer, at least according to the plain unambiguous language of the statute, I would submit should be no. Um, it, it says sale or exchange, and that's what it says uh, under Section 102, a gift or request is, is, is not a sale or exchange. So under the Internal Revenue Code, plain unambiguous language, it should not be treated um, I would respectfully submit as a, a, a taxable event. However, under the second tranche proposed regulation that came out on May 1st, it is treated as an inclusion event unless you happen to have a gift or actually, quote unquote, a contribution to a special type of trust that is called a granter trust, which is treated as one and the same person as the person who makes a contribution for income tax purposes. Now, I looked at that, I compared it to the statute, it does, very respectfully, it does not square with the statute. And that was noted in the preamble to the proposed regulations. The proposed regulations did in the preambles then said, they went back to the legislative history, the conference report, 
And in the conference report, it talks about a disposition and it, 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 it goes off the sale and exchange concept. You'll see that in the comment letter, and this again begins the part two, beginning on page six, we go very meticulously through the conference report. It doesn't evidence an intent to stay to basically change a very clear precept in the Internal Revenue Code. Again, I respectfully submit that. Uh, if Congress wanted to change, wanted to have gifts deemed as sales or exchanges, so as to trigger this, they could have done it very easily. They did not. Uh, and again, there's nothing that if you look at the entire legislative history in the conference report, again, I've quoted language verbatim, um, that would suggest that there is some loose language, but then if you view it in context, it does not show an intent for, for an expansive reading to override what's in the plain and ambiguous language of the statute. So that that is, is one point that we would request um, revision on. Uh, I talked about gifts being an exception, but there's an exception as there is in the Internal Revenue Code. We love our exceptions to exceptions, and there is the case of if instead of having a an outright gift, say to an individual, I give it to to my son, um, make a gift to my son of an interest in qualified opportunity fund, which would be a trigger. Uh, again, under the proposed regulations, I would submit it should not be under the system of the statute. But if instead I made a gift to a grantor trust, which is a trust that usually I would create, that for tax purposes has certain triggers in it that cause it to be one and the same as me uh, for income tax purposes, uh, then the proposed regulations, corrected, um, state that that is disregarded. And that will not be an inclusion of that. If there's a further distribution from the trust, and it's not by reason of death, that could be an inclusion of that. Uh, down the road, uh, but the actual contribution of uh, an interest in a qualified opportunity fund to a grantor trust would, would not be would not be that. And just following on this is this is the third point uh, that begins over on page ten um, of of, my, of of the Act Tech report. So, what are some of the issues that are raised there? Well. Two a couple of things you need to bear in mind with grant and trust. So number one, the grant source of being the example, I set up a trust, I retain certain powers, including maybe the power of substitute assets of equivalent value as a grant or trust trigger, section 675-4C of the code. That allows it to be a grant or trust, and the income that's derived from the assets, including the qualified opportunity fund, they are all taxed to me during my lifetime as, as the grant source. So that's one benefit. Basically, it all flows through. There's another important provision uh, that needs to be considered, and that is Revenue Ruling 85-13. Revenue Ruling 85-13. And that says that if I have a transaction with the grant or trust, let's say I were to sell assets to the grant or trust, could be whether it's an interest in a qualified opportunity fund, and I take and I get back cash or a promissory note or other property in kind, it's as though I'm dealing right pocket, left pocket, all with myself. It's a tax, nothing for income tax purposes. Revenue Rule 85 13 says basically across the board it's a tax, nothing. We respectfully submit that the proposed regulations uh, should similarly have. Uh, in, in, or rather the regulations finalized to similarly so state that. So that not only a contribution of an interest in a qualified opportunity fund, and this, the proposed regulations talk about a contribution, interesting, the preamble talks about a gift. Presumably that's one and the same. If that could be clarified, that would be very helpful. But if I were to have other transactions that are within the purview of 85-13, basically anything during my lifetime while as a grant or trust, it could be a sale, it could be a, a, a swap of assets, it could be a, a, a distribution, uh, including in kind, that should not be a, an inclusion event. And it seems to be consistent with, with the events here, but that, that needs to be clarified. Importantly, because grant or trust also is treated as one and the same as me, it should not matter if the source of funds that are used to go to the qualified opportunity funds come from the qual come from the grant or trust or come from me directly. It, again, Revenue Rule 85 13, grant or trust provisions 671 through 679 of the code, treated as one and the same, and therefore that should be respected all the way across the board here. Now, what are some of the other issues? I'm going to point four, which is on page 11. Here, here are some items to, to consider. There were, in the proposed regulations that, that came out, actually the first tranche that came out last year, very helpful relief provisions to the 180-day rule. Um, 
that that's basically the rule that says you have a capital gain, you have 180 days to invest in the qualified opportunity fund. If you don't, you lose the opportunity to defer and have possible basis adjustments. And then after 10 years of depreciation, be able to avoid avoid tax on that. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna, that that's very helpful. Where this could be problematic, let's say, and, and there were some relief provisions. So one relief provision says that if I have to be a partner in a partnership, uh, instead of looking at the partnership, it could, unless an election is made to the contrary, it could be the partner who then had, it has the ability to defer the gain because the partner gets taxed on it anyway based on by receiving a K-1. And then unless an election is made otherwise, it's the end of the tax year that's used for the 108 period to start. So that would be, in most cases, many cases, December 31. So I could have had, the partnership could have had the, um, the sale occur February last year. Well over, uh, well over a, a year ago, but because it was a partnership and because an election was made otherwise, December 31, 2018 could have been the trigger date to start the 108-day clock, and as long as the investment was made by June 29th of this year, it would, it would qualify. What are some of the issues that, that arise, partnerships as corporations and also apply to trust in states? This is dependent on effective communication between effectively the fiduciary, the manager, and the beneficiary or partner or S corporation shareholder. And the communication device is the K-1. And that works wonderfully if the, if the tax returns are filed properly, the K-1s are issued properly, and, and then there's, and all that gets, gets shared. But that's not how the real world often works. Um, quite often, especially with any measure of complexity, quite often with partnerships, S corporations, and also trusts and estates, returns go on extension. And if returns go on extension, you're talking about due dates in September, October for the, um, for the K-1 to even have to issue. And by the time the partner or S corporation shareholder or beneficiary of the trust or estate gets the K-1, Lo and behold, you'll see, as described in the example that, that I provide in materials, uh, it could well be September. And at that point, they're completely out of luck because they're more than 180 days out from the window. So our proposal here is that at, just as there was relief provided for the 180-day uh, situation in the case of partnerships, that in order to achieve the incentive, the objectives here of substantial economic investment in economic distressed communities, i.e. opportunity zones with capital gains the funding mechanism, there should be allowance here that says the 180-day period runs from the later of the 180-day period under the current proposed regulations, or if, if later, 180 days from the filing of the tax, of the, the timely filed, including extensions to the tax return that issued the K-1. My time is very short, just a couple brief points. Basis adjustments, what happens upon death under section 691, which, which is incorporated by reference here, there is no step up in basis. However, you'll see, and this is point five, if, however, there is appreciation value through date of death, that is not an amount that's recognized in this section pursuant to the language of the statute. Therefore, that amount should not be tied to 691, which basically carries over the, uh, the deferred gain uh, to, the, uh, to the person who happens to, to be holding on to the investment at the time of the recognition event, such as December 31, 2026. And that amount through data debt should be subject to step up in basis. And then just the last point, 15 seconds, and I see that I'm out of time. Uh, what happens to an inheritance uh, where someone inherits an interest in a qualified opportunity fund, and lo and behold, they have nothing to pay the tax on from December 31, 2026 for less relief. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Maps. Do we have any com uh, questions? Okay. Okay. Do you see? Okay. Do you? Thanks. Do you see in the code any mechanism for donating tax liability? I'm sorry. I didn't catch that. Okay. You you suggested that gift should not count as a dis could, should not count as an inclusion event. Yes. Um, are you suggesting that the sale or exchange by the donee would trigger a tax liability for the donor 
if the donor happens to know of it? Or are you suggesting that the sale or exchange by the donee triggers liability for the donor's historic capital gains? Well, I, I think the, the better reason results here should be that the donee, upon receiving it, unless we have a grant or trust, so a grant or no, trust, I'm, I'm, we're, 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 let's, say, let's say I'm making gifts myself. Yeah, we're, we're talking, talking about uh, not a grant or trust. In that case, the sale or exchange by the donee should trigger tax to the donee. That, that I think is a better reason to do. And, and, the, and if, 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 there if, the, if, the donor, if the donee sells and uh, let's say hypothetically that uh, uh, you know, it, the donee may have uh, some uh, gain because of the low, low basis that it picks up. But uh, you're saying that the uh, donee then picks up the historic gain by the, by the donor. Right. So, and that would be consistent with how well, it, 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 that might have been a very reasonable way for Congress to have drafted it, but do you think that uh, a donee who says, I don't see any obligation on my part, I got a gift. I don't owe anything for gains that my uh, kind uncle may have deferred uh, before I was born. Well, in that case, the, the donee has an obligation enforceable by the Internal Revenue Service and uh, under what habit section? Well, if, if the donee has property and it has, it has zero basis, perhaps, or maybe an adjustment of basis over the course of time of putting that aside, so it's zero basis and it sells it, it has a gain. It has a capital gain, presumably, that then will trigger tax consequences to the donee. If the donee fails to pay it, that is tax evasion. And, if, and if, if the donee has losses, then so be it. The the donor's uh, liability is subsumed in the donor's losses. Well, that actually is a situation that applies right now. So it could be that a donor, as a capital gain, doesn't make a transfer, or an individual's capital gain does not make a gift to a donee, and then in, in a year prior to 2026, has losses, sells the interest of the qualified opportunity fund then, and then is able to basically have zero tax. So that's no change from the current situation that the posture of the case. Uh, in terms of clarifying that the uh, tax nothing attribute of the grant or trust better reflected, is there anything else, is there anything in the current proposed regulations where you see an implication that we would fail to reflect and respect uh, Rev. Rule 8513? That, that's an excellent point. Um, I don't see anything that necessarily cuts away at it, but it, it isn't addressed, and therefore it would be very helpful to clarify. There are, lot, there are lots of obvious consequences of current law that we don't address. That, 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 that is true. are wrong enough as it is. That, that is true. But it could be that maybe simply an example to say that if there's a sale, take back the promissory note, that is governed by Revenue Rule 85 13, and therefore it effectively is the same sort of work if because it's a tax stop. Okay. Uh, finally, you raised the point in your comments that uh, the IRD may put the, uh, the beneficiary uh, in the posture of, of having tax liability for which it has no you know, capacity to tax. Uh, are you suggesting something like a uh, an automatic with underpayment interest extension of the liability date so that the uh, liability would be measured uh, at an appropriate time, but there would be recognition of the fact that uh, the uh, person's uh, liable for the IRD uh, ought to get some uh, temporal relief uh, that where Treasury is made whole by interest. That is an excellent suggestion. Um, it, some relief is needed because anytime you plan right now, basically you almost have to plan the life insurance. You, know, you have to talk about that, which means then you have to have the traditional set up of the life insurance trust to make it tax efficient. And then you have to match the trustee, the beneficiaries to whoever has the interest in the qualified opportunity fund. There's a lot to take into account. 
some sort of relief is needed. And I do completely understand your point that, well, the statute says that and how far people go down the statute. But if there's some sort of relief provided, installment payment plan, um, and, and that could be the administrators will be built and that would that would go a long way to, to addressing this concern. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is James Rose from the Rose Development LLC. Hello, thank you. It's great to be here. I was here at the first hearing. Uh, back in February, it was gonna be in January, and I was here with my wife. And the reason why we were here back then was that we are, I'm not a develop. I'm not, I am a developer. I am not an attorney, I'm not an accountant. And I'm also partnered with the state of Utah on some of my developments. And one day, I'm having one of my partnership meetings, and the director walks in with this, uh, this letter from the governor nominating 47 census tracts. And says, "Can you look this up and tell me what what is this?" You know, and it was the first time I'd ever heard of anything like that. It was in about April or June, about June first. And boy, this has really changed things for us. Because at first I was like, "Well, what the heck? What's a what's a cent, what, what, Where's the map that shows me where these census tracts are so I can understand what properties <laughs> that we have with the state of Utah that we're developing and giving a large portion of the money to the students." you know, whether or not these developments are inside an uh, opportunity zone. And so it really, uh, it, it sent us down a certain path. Then we decided, well, we better, we better, <coughs> once we figured out that it had to go through a fund, and then it had to go to, you know, you, you go through all the regulations and the, and the processes, we decided we better do a fund. Well, then it was like, well, if we need to find an attorney that knows this and can help us do this the right way. So we drafted a set of documents, and we found out that there were going to be these regulations, these, these guidance, uh, these guidance uh, comments and whatnot. Well, here, here is the first and second regs right here, right? The first one came out in October. It was about 73 pages, and it set us back because we thought, whoa, there are really so many issues not being an attorney not being accountant that I didn't even know no, were, were possible issues in the first place, right? I mean, we're developers. I'm a licensed general contractor. I was a licensed general contractor builder in the state of Utah when I got my license. I'm also a principal broker in Utah and in Nevada. So I know a lot about transactions as it comes to real estate building and, and doing things like that. So this, this process that we've been going through uh, has kind of led us to the point where we're thinking, all right, how do we take something so complicated and make it simple for us to really be able to use, right? And for us to be able to explain to our friends and for my wife and I to do our family planning with for the next, until 2047, right? And so one of the funny things that happened to us is that on December 7th, 2017, my wife and I closed on about 20 assets in an opportunity zone for the purpose of improving these assets, you know, for the community and doing exactly what the law really helps developers do, but we did it about 20 days too soon, right? So we understand how important it is to know all the little uh, nuances of this law. So what we want to do is make it as simple as possible in, in the big ways for when people can so that normal people can understand and verify what fund managers, now we're, now we're fund managers, right? We're not just developers and builders. Now all of a sudden we, we have to manage a fund, we're a fund manager for our own projects. But so that when we talk to other people as fund managers, that they can get the information without having to hire a bunch of accountants and attorneys for just the big concepts, right? And that's, that's why I wrote on my comments about the IRS website, www.irs.gov. And it's, it's a wonderful resource and tool. Uh, I think it could be updated a little bit. You know, we have these regs that have been coming out, and there's some really great things that have kind of transferred over onto the website that I think could happen. 
and there could be more of the kind of you know uh, opportunity zones for dummies kind of sections, right? And it kind of gets into what or maybe even just opportunity zones for real people, rather than yeah, like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, because sometimes we feel like dummies when we're kind of going through this. Uh, you know, and when you look at my, you know, I like to print things off, and I've been printing off everything that you've been, you know, submitting and writing to us, and cross-reference it, and, you know, trying to figure it all out, and some of the things, you know, we can kind of, we should be able to rely on, for normal, as normal people, and some of the things, yeah, we might need to, you know, get our attorneys to get some opinion on, but there should be parts that we don't have to do that for, and so one of the things that I noticed on the website recently, because I went back to check uh, before all of this came, was that the, uh, in the frequently asked questions page on the opportunity zones, there should be more detail and clarification given as to what is a qualified opportunity fund. Currently, the FAQ, the fact page, answers the question, what is a qualified opportunity fund? With an answer indicating that it is a vehicle for investing in eligible property located in the Qualified Opportunity Zone, right? For someone unfamiliar with the Act, uh, the stated answer could be interpreted as only including real property located within an Opportunity Zone. This interpretation would miss an additional and major benefit of the Act, which is the investment in Qualified Opportunity Zone businesses. And given the potential for growth and positive impact that QSEBs can bring to opportunity zones, this benefit of the act should be more clearly stated in the answer. So as somebody from my local community of Utah, where we have 47 zones, and my current office is, was located by somewhat inside of an opportunity zone, um, I look at this and, and I start speaking to people about it, and all of a sudden they start looking at me and my local community like I'm some kind of an expert. And so I keep saying, well, listen, I am not an expert in this, but I am the guy that just recently held the first stakeholders meeting in my community with the mayors of my communities and the city council members and so on and so forth. And not one of them knew hardly anything about this and the misconceptions were just unbelievable. So articles have come out and people have started calling me and I'm sitting here thinking, how can we make this the most reliable for everyone? And that is pointing back to the IRS website. We could have these, you know, little bit clever pieces of clarification uh, that people can go and fact check what what others are telling them, whether it's their attorneys or or whoever it might be. And then uh, I reluctantly bring this last part up, which is just about the act itself. I know that you don't want to really hear that, but as we have gone through different revisions of PPMs, our you know private placement memorandums, if there's anybody else out there like me that may have never <laughs> been into these things before, we have had revision after revision based <laughs> off of the guidelines. But when we look at raising additional funds from people, you know, we can only right now bring in tax advantage or, or uh, deferred capital gains money. And I know that you have to change the act and we're not here to do that, okay, the law. But where you have latitude to kind of make exceptions or create possibilities where some of the people that call me that want to move their businesses into these zones, that want to do kind of like tenure planning, if, if it's something that you can do where, you know, the part where if they leave their money in there for 10 years, you know, and there's capital gains, it shouldn't really matter, that's my big point, whether that money came from capital gains. If they're willing to go through all the rules yeah, they're not going to get an increase in basis, none of that applies to them, but they should be able to get some of those benefits. And I don't know all the ways in which you could make that possible where there could be, hey, they're leaving their money in the, that, those funds in the fund, right, for 10 years. And the fund then is investing in the QZBs or QZBPs, properties, projects. Then, then it, and if, and if they're, you're not able to in some way make that happen so that that money can be tax advantaged, then perhaps as we are selling or making money, capital gains in our QOZDs, and then we're sending that money back up to our QOFs, right, our Qualified Opportunity Funds, then, then maybe there's something that we can do that clarifies the ability to take those capital, some of, some of that money somehow. I mean, I don't know where the latitude is here. 
but it would be extremely helpful. But either way, the more simple we can make this. And, and one other point about the IRS website, you even have a little section that said, if you are a QSED, a, a business, and you want to do a QSED, here are the one, two, threes, or, or like a checklist of 10 things that you need to start off with. That would be incredibly helpful. That's, that's it, that's all I have to say. Any questions for Mr. Rose? Just one in terms of you know, uh, sharing your predilection for printing stuff out and then coming across something that is in need of clarification. Uh, when I printed your hearing outline, I came across 1K3 hyphen 9ALY hyphen BB67 which, uh, and then uh, something else as well, with a similarly, similar opacity. Uh, it, it's comments that you say you had submitted before, but I wasn't smart enough to figure out where to find them. Mm. So I would love to. PRM1? Right. You know, and we would love to see I will, uh, I apologize for that. And, and there again, yeah, this is our, my first time ever getting involved in, in something like this. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm hearing about that. Thank I'm, you. Uh, I'll, I'll, that, you know, I, I saw the summary of what you said. Yeah. Uh, some of it was, as you recognized, maybe uh, in addition to uh, alerting us to your frustrations, which we also have some frustration, mm -hmm. uh, you may want to communicate that to the people who actually can change the law. Uh, but in addition, since you made those comments and you want us to benefit from them, I would like to. Absolutely, yeah, there was a clerical error there. I thought that was not a problem. Thank you for bringing that to my if, attention. If you don't have any clerical errors I made, you would understand that I, I know where you're coming from. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker is Fran Siegel, U.S. Impact Investing Alliance. Good morning, folks. Great to see you, many of you again. Um, I'm Fran Siegel, Executive Director of the U.S. Impact Investing Alliance. So the U.S. Impact Investing Alliance uh, and our members represent collectively about 1,000 private uh, investors and financial intermediaries who are actively engaged in deploying private capital to advance the public good. We believe in leveraging the power of markets to create uh, measurable social, economic, and environmental benefits, and that investors can play an important role in achieving desirable policy outcomes. Many of our members and our stakeholders have particularly deep knowledge of and track record in investing uh, for community economic development. They include institutional investors, foundations, uh, pension funds, university endowments, uh, net, uh, high net worth individuals, banks, and community development finance institutions that understand the importance of place, local context, and authentic community engagement when investing in low-income communities. For this reason, we have taken a key interest in opportunity funds, opportunity zones, and the development of pertinent regulations. And it's based on consultation with these members that I ought to offer the testimony to you today. In previous comments before you and in several iterations of written comments, we have underscored the critical importance of timely, accurate, and consistent data collection and reporting. We believe that of the remaining issues to be ad addressed by Treasury in its rule rulemaking, this is perhaps the most important, certainly the most important to us and the members that we represent. We are heartened to see that Treasury released an a request for information on data collection and tracking and opportunity zones and we're likewise glad to see that this issue has been taken up by the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council. We're grateful to those of you here today and your colleagues throughout the administration for their efforts to elevate this topic of, of impact accountability and community engagement. Before I address data and reporting requirements, I'd like to first quickly address the issue of rules to prevent abuse. It was encouraging that the notice of proposed rulemaking included broad authority to recharacterize abusive transactions as non-qualifying. In final regulations, we recommend the Treasury should seek to provide greater clarity about the circumstances in which this authority may be exercised. Qualified opportunity funds are given greater, great flexibility in deploying capital in opportunity zones. 
The authors of the statute were clear in their goal to see a broad range of operating businesses and other investments supported to meet the needs of qualified opportunity zones. Treasury in particular, with the latest proposed regulation, has approached the rulemaking process in a manner, manner consistent with this intent. But this flexibility also creates significant room for abuse. And it would be impractical to enumerate every type of potential abuse. In our written comments, we articulate a three-part approach to this topic. First and final rules, the IRS commissioner should maintain the broad authority to recharacterize abusive investments as such. Second, Treasury should define some clear potential abuse of actions such as land banking to immediately prevent such predictable negative outcomes. And third, Treasury should consider the adoption of a safe harbor, such as independent certification of the community benefit practices of opportunity funds to provide investors with an additional degree of certainty that their investments are being well managed, do not violate and do not violate these abuse rules. We provide greater detail, detail on all points of this approach and our written comments. But on this last point, I would like to underscore that the private sector tools needed to implement independent certification are already under development. Uh, several speakers already mentioned this opportunity zones reporting framework, which is a private sector um, standard for reporting that was developed by our organization, the U.S. Impact Investing Alliance, in partnership with the New York Federal, Federal Reserve Bank and the Beck Center at Georgetown. So a broad range of groups, including us, have worked to develop these frameworks, tools, and methodologies that could be used as the basis for an independent certification program. With a safe harbor tied to independent certification, we believe that significant numbers of opportunity fund managers would be incentivized to voluntarily take part. We believe that with sufficient participation, these market-led efforts would become financially viable, these certification efforts. Standards would need to be instituted for which certifications qualify for safe harbor protection, and these certifications would need to be continuously monitored over the course of the program. We believe that the CDFI fund would be naturally suited to handling this task, given their experience managing other effective community development programs. As discussed in my introduction, I want to spend the balance of my time on the vital importance of tracking and publicly reporting on fund and transaction level data about opportunity zone investments. The opportunity zones market cannot function efficiently without access to basic transaction data about qualified opportunity funds and their investments. For this reason, we recommend the Treasury collect and report publicly on basic fund and transaction level data about qualified opportunity fund activities in a consistent and timely manner. Doing so would achieve the goal of tracking the effectiveness of the policy and create multiple benefits directly uh, increasing that effect effectiveness. While we applaud Treasury for its thoughtful RFI on this topic, the time lagged and aggregated data envisioned in that document would be entirely insufficient to assess the efficacy of the policy. Fund and transaction level reporting should be collected in a manner other than through a tax form, likely through a web portal. And the information should be made available to the public in a disaggregated, anonymized, and timely fashion. Such reporting would not create a meaningful burden on qualified opportunity fund managers, and the public benefit of such reporting was articulated in a wide range of public comments submitted to Treasury um, to its RFI on the topic. The statutory language creating opportunity zones gives, tre gives Treasury the necessary authority to collect and report basic fund and transaction data. Collection of this data will enable qualified opportunity fund managers to track and certify their compliance with the statute. And the Secretary is given the specific authority to promulgate regulations that facilitate the certification of qualified opportunity funds. Furthermore, while we primarily see this data collection effort as a means to promote the efficient formation and deployment of capital, an ancillary benefit would be to inform Treasury in promulgating and enforcing rules to prevent abuse, another point on which the Secretary has specific authority to institute reporting requirements. Finally, Treasury has repeatedly and, cl and, and clearly articulated that the purpose of the statute is to promote economic activity and opportunity zones. This intent is further supported by the statutory language and le legislative history of Regulation 1400C. In previous written comments, we have discussed at length 
the benefits that basic and, trend, uh, and transparent reporting will have for market participation. To quickly summarize this point, reporting will increase investor confidence, enable more efficient capital management, and promote effective partnership with state and local governments. Again, the Secretary has given broad authority to prom promulgate rules that advance this legislative purpose and could, under that authority, institute reporting requirements. Such a reporting process would require a minimum level of staffing within Treasury to implement reporting, ensure completeness and accuracy of data, and prepare reports. The CDFI Fund provides a model for its role in implementing and overseeing the New Markets Tax Credits Program, and we suggest that the Secretary consider leveraging this existing resource to support implementation of Opportunity Zones reporting requirement, requirements. Thank you once more for the opportunity to testify. We remain deeply optimistic that once these remaining points are clarified, this policy can be used to improve the lives of the 32 million residents living in Opportunity Zones today. The taxpayers of this country have made and will make a tremendous investment in the economic potential of Opportunity Zones. I urge you, here, urge you here today to give us the tools we need to measure and affirm the impact of those investments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody on the panel? Question? No? Um. It would help even if it was not uh, an exhaustive list for you to give us some examples of abuses which you think we ought to write into the regs, and in particular, what the consequences of those abuses ought to be for either the fund or the ultimate investment, the, mm -hmm. the, the business, the fund, or the investors. Because, um, yeah, the, the, so the, the, the IRS and, and Treasury uh, are not comfortable <laughs> about being concerned about abuse, but we need to know. Mm -hmm. uh, you refer to uh, the importance of providing for independent certification, essentially of, of uh, consistency with uh, the legislative history's articulation of the purpose. Um, would, you know, there are a variety of questions that are related in part to who would do this. Uh, would such uh, certification be conclusory? In other words, uh, you've got private actors, you've got a lot of money involved. Uh, it would not be unheard of uh, for an otherwise magnificent uh, independent force to get captured by the uh, transactional process. The fascinating podcast by uh, Michael Lewis, if you haven't listened to it. Um, so would a, would a positive response be absolutely conclusory. The IRS could not look behind it and say, we don't think that this was a, uh, a fair and independent evaluation. Uh, but the consequence of the failure there ought to be done. And are you imagining a, an appeal process for someone who says, I should have gotten my certification and you can give it to me and uh, it may have been negligence, it may have been a different judgment, it may have been corrupt, but uh, it would be unusual and possibly inappropriate for some uh, uh, private actor um, absent statutory delegation of responsibility to get this kind of control over whether or not a taxpayer gets the benefits that the taxpayer thinks that it is entitled to. Uh, in terms of the uh, transaction by transaction tracking, uh, you said that, well, 
this isn't going to be collected by the IRS, and implicitly you seem to suggest that therefore it would not be subject to uh, the privacy assurances in Section 6103, Part 3 numbers instead of concepts. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure that, that uh, this would, that you know, the, the kind of granular analysis which you're suggesting be made public, I mean, we're, we're looking to whether or not that kind of granular information can be collected for government evaluation of what's going on, but making that kind of granular analysis public, uh, even if, uh, as you put it, uh, uh, anonymized, but disaggregated, uh, if there is a transaction that is described and it is in uh, census tract X, and there's only one uh, fund operating in census tract X, being anonymized doesn't do much good. And so uh, I think the privacy issues are important. And then finally, um, lacking explicit statutory mandate, you said there's regulatory authority, but not the statute. Um, suppose somebody says, I don't feel like filing this information. What are the consequences? The, should the IRS enforce uh, filing by denying the tax benefits? Uh, should the filing be done uh, with a jurat under penalties of perjury? Uh, I think the, the, uh, the general desirability of taking uh, a tax incentive which is as uh, inviting Y'all come uh, as this one is, with no aggregate limit on the amount of referrals that would be possible. Enough people to take up the invitation. Uh, the risk that all of the problems that Cunningham identified might come true are there. But uh, step, concrete steps to ensure that uh, what Congress <coughs> says it wanted it gets uh, are not not simple or automatic. Okay, I'll do my best to answer those. Wish I had taken my pen up here. Um, <laughs> so I'll do my best and happy to take some um, some of it. Did you skip one? I may have. <clears throat> Yeah, I second the um, examples for abusive transactions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I ju just as a kind of a, um, a high level thought, um, we believe, and uh, you know, we're part of the also the EIG coalition, the Democratic coalition, and uh, our members um, feel that in exchange for the tax advantage capital that Opportunity Zones uh, represents, that uh, the disclosure of data so that we can ascertain the efficacy of a policy is a very reasonable trade. Um, well, to that, you need to go somewhere else mm -hmm. because that's not in the statute at this point. So, mm -hmm. understood, understood. And someone else mentioned that um, that, uh, that reporting was, was stripped out of the statutory language on for parliamentary reasons, and we're aware of that. I'm not able to speak about live legislation because I'm not allowed to lobby, um, so I, I won't opine on that topic uh, here, nor is it appropriate in this forum. Um, but uh, I'm just saying what, what our members believe. So we're, what, um, we are communicating the testimony is, is two pieces around data. One is uh, trend, uh, Fund and transaction level data disclosed to um, a central data repository and then available to 
to state, local, federal governments, policymakers, academic, as a way for us to ascertain whether the opportunity uh, zone uh, benefit has been efficacious. And our, again, our belief um, is that economic, community economic development is, the, is a desired result. Um, and so what we envision there, and I'll, I'll get to this piece about certification and rules to prevent abuse, abuse in a moment, but what we asked for actually in our first com public comment letter, and I, I testified in this on Valentine's Day of earlier this, year, earlier this year, we're asking for um, <coughs> capital raised uh, into an opportunity fund, um, property acquired, amount invested in each deal, indeed, location by census tract, um, NA, NAICS code sharing the business type so that we can start understand and, and we actually ask for additional information including jobs creation, percentage of units affordable where appropriate, um, new business starts, a business ownership type with a special focus on women and, women and minority entrepreneurs and poverty reduction which you know many folks believe that that is an outcome that should not be that would be burdensome on the fund manager. And so we threw that in there, but I think that it's really important throughout all of these discussions around data to understand what is appropriate use of uh, and requests of fund managers and what is best uh, analyzed by policymakers and, and academics and, and think tanks. And so there, what we're envisioning is disclosure um, through a web portal similar to the one that is used by the CDFI fund uh, to administer new markets tax credits. I take your point about privacy and if you know, there is indeed one investment in one opportunity zone that, uh, that, that is problematic. Um, but we still believe that um, what, what, was, what, was at, what was suggested in the RFI from Treasury was uh, single numbers, complete uh, kind of programmatic aggregation uh, uh, issued, you know, every handful of years, and we feel like that is insufficient. So that's kind of one topic, and we'll, we'll try to wrap it up. I see, you know, we have a, a time constraint. On the issue of rules to prevent abuse, there, what we're asking for is a certification of safe harbor, saying that if you use a third-party certifier, uh, indeed a private uh, sector certifier, um, those certifiers which, sorry, certifiers which would be certified by, say, the CDFI fund in some kind of interagency agreement, in the same way that there was an interagency agreement between the IRS and the CDFI fund in certifying the 8,700 um, opportunity zones. Um, and so, you know, you, you asked um, the representative from Opportunity Finance Network about this issue of certification. What we're, we're asking here around the um, uh, rules to prevent the use of safe harbor, um, uh, a certification program where, a, say, a CDFI fund would certify the certifiers, so there wouldn't be need need to be a certifier. And you know, just your your point, your question to uh, to OFN earlier today. So that's sort of what we imagine. Um, I'm happy to disclose um, in writing answers to some of your other questions if you feel that I don't have time to answer them at this time. Yeah. I see you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, thank we would you. love to hear from you, but we have a lot one, of speakers. One thing to add to that, and that is uh, when you do, uh, a lot of people have criticized the selection by governors of, in some cases, uh, uh, census tracts that were gentrifying. And by the time and have in fact gentrified by the time the governors made the designations uh, and uh, are you suggesting that uh, there would be some impairment of investors ability to go into those tracks because there really is uh, little social benefit derived particularly from the, uh, uh, the loss of tax revenue mm -hmm. The Urban Institute did a report, as you probably saw, that showed three to four percent of census tracts that were selected are have experienced gentrification. So it's still a relatively small percentage, but we know it's a concern. So I look forward to following up with greater details and examples. On it, 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 it may be more than three to four percent of the yes. total investment. Pardon? It may be more than three to four percent of the total investment yes. into, into tracts. Yes. Understood. Well, thank you. Thank, yep. you, very thank much. you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, our next speaker is Steve Glutman. He is from the Develop LLC. Thank 
Thank you to the, uh, the panel for having me back to testify. I was here in, in February testifying on the first round of regulations. Um, I will be complimentary on the second round, but I will also have a number of issues uh, in line with, with the first round of regulations, which just take us constructive criticism and, and, and nothing more for us. Uh, my name is Steve Wickman. I'm the founder and uh, CEO of Develop LLC. Uh, between 2013 and 2018, I was the founder and uh, CEO of the uh, Economic Innovation Group, co-founder along with uh, John Parker and John Lettieri, which was uh, deeply involved with the um, architecture behind the Opportunity Zone program. Um, over the past year, I've spent most of my time in and around the country um, talking and working with Opportunity Zone fund managers, with wealth managers, with community leaders, with Opportunity Zone businesses and developers and others, uh, trying to educate um, uh, various parts of the country and, and various industries about the program and how it works, uh, and working with um, individual clients as they attempt to utilize the program. And so a lot of these comments are built along in, in the spirit of how are, how is the market practically responding to um, some aspects of this, and where do I think there may be some, some easy areas for the IRS in finalizing these rules to make this more workable along um, the intent of the program, which is one, to, to raise a transformative amount of capital for opportunity zone communities and being able to do that through various types of fund structures and also to ensure that the deployment of funds go both to operating businesses as well as real estate of, of all types. And uh, I'll get to how those, a few of those pieces I think are playing out. Um, I'm, a, I'm a member of the um, uh, EIG um, Opportunity Zone Coalition and the Democratic Working Group, and I think both they, along with the ABA, have put together very uh, <coughs> thorough and uh, excellent jobs at uh, providing a very detailed look at the regulations with recommendations that are broadly, I think, consistent with each other and overlapping, which I think is a, a good sign that the market's coalescing around where it needs. I think there are two big categories I want to point out. One relates to the formation of multi-asset funds, and one relates to the utilization of opportunity zones for operating businesses. And there's a few issues within there that I think the IRS uh, needs to do on before finalizing. The most important, I think, aspect for multi-asset funds is actually a very easy one. Um, I, I think the IRS did a good job in the regulations in April of, of um, outlining a, an exit strategy for single assets single asset exits out of multi-asset funds. And there's, I, I know some commentary on different ways to structure it, but the far more important, I think, issue right now is that it's the only part of the regs, really, that the IRS left open to speculation from the investor community in saying that's the only part of the regulations that investors and fund managers can't rely on. And the impact of that, I think, is quite substantial. While there are multi-asset funds in the market, it's not unreasonable as a multi-asset fund manager when, when having to address questions from investors to, to, to be concerned with the fact that they don't have a good answer to why that part of the statute hasn't been finalized, hasn't, hasn't been allowed to, uh, or, or, or why investors haven't been instructed they can rely on that part of the statute. Uh, my sense is that IRS assumed that this would be an issue that fund managers would have to address until much later on in their life cycle because many of these funds are structured to exit 10 years or beyond. The reality is the structuring decisions are being made right now. And without the clarity that you can exit single asset, uh, exit on single assets without a tax event, um, you know, investors are much more hesitant to invest in those funds. And I think you're seeing that in the fundraising. I think multi-asset funds, while some are having success, many are uh, facing a slower fundraising cycle than they expected, in part because of this uh, feature of the regulations. So I think even before the full finalization of the regulations for Treasury to, to put out uh, a, a, an additional amendment or, a, or, or an additional piece of regulation that they created that the existing rules can be relied upon, and of course IRS can, can change its mind and, or, or clarify further in finalizing the structure, uh, would do a big part to getting more capital into the market. One piece, though, of, of the multi-asset fund structure that I think is it has created some questions in the market relates to depreciation recapture. Um, right now, it's it, it's fairly clear that exiting out a single asset uh, or multi-asset um, real estate funds and the single asset basis, you would avoid uh, uh, depreciation recapture because it, it would be treated as a capital gains and the regs make clear that single asset exit would not be subject to capital gains. But if you're exiting out of, let's say, a renewable energy vehicle where you're selling assets that would be treated as the sale of personal property and less ordinary income, 
uh, out of a multi-asset fund, it, it reads right now as if the tax treatment would be different. We would be subject to a tax event unless you organize those assets into single asset funds. And of course, that's possible to do, but quite cumbersome if the goal is to, again, aggregate a lot of capital for, in this case, a renewable energy asset class or other sort of business asset classes within these zones. There's no uh, policy reason why we should be treating real estate, let's say, different from renewable energy, and, and no reason you should have to enter into an exotic structure if you're structuring on real estate multi-asset funds in order to get the same benefit, which is to avoid depreciation recapture at the uh, sale of individual assets after 10 years. The third piece I'd say is a little more controversial, but I think important. And uh, after the October regulations, uh, the Treasury and IRS uh, made clear that there were three eligible classes of investments that opportunity zone funds could make. They could make equity investments, preferred, equ they could have preferred uh, uh, equity interest, preferred equity interest, and special allocations. Special allocations, I think, was read as mar much of the market is allowing for carried interest to receive the opportunity zone fund treatment. And in the April regulations, uh, the IRS made clear that uh, for any um, interests that are not a uh, purchase from an investment in the fund, as opposed to treated to uh, uh, by sweat out equity in the allocation, that those type of interests would be treated differently. And I understand the rationale for that, but I think it carries some unintended consequences. One of which is I think you limit the number of professional fund managers who are gonna engage in the marketplace. As a fund manager, the primary benefit uh, of this program is uh, creating ease of capital raising. And for a lot of fund managers, that's important. For professional and other institutional fund managers, I think it's much less important. And be, not, not being able to tap into the opportunity zone benefit, I think will limit the amount of those type of fund managers we have in the market, which I would argue is important, given, as we've all seen, the complications of, or the complexity of, of the program and the rules involved, and that the shared desire we all have to ensure these funds meet their intended purposes. But maybe the far more important issue is that it's, start, it's starting to create, as I'm uh, observing, a fundamental misal misalignment between fund managers and LPs. And that especially occurs in the case of um, opportunity-style real estate funds, where much of the, the value is derived in the first years of the construction or rehabilitation, and once you have stabilization, you start to have a diminishing return in those funds. That creates an enormous amount of pressure for fund managers to sell well before the 10-year mark. Uh, they may really have a fiduciary responsibility because they can meet the, uh, they can receive at the highest price, you know, five or six or seven years into the marketplace. When investors, you know, have a tax reason to stay in, in uh, ensure they can stay invest in that asset for 10 years or more. And there's no reason to have that misalignment. Uh, I'd argue with the carried interest treatment as was originally envisioned in the October regulations, it would create a natural alignment to ensure we have a long-term <coughs> plus investments in these funds where you don't then have this artificial misalignment between the length of time LP, it wishes to stay invested in the fund, and the length of time of GPs incentivized to manage that capital. On the, on the operating business side, I think there's some much more fundamental questions. The most important relates to how we treat substantial uh, the substantial improvement test and whether we are looking at it asset by asset or as an aggregate basis. It's, it's fundamentally not practical to invest in an existing opportunity to zone business and expect to improve each individual asset, which may be a chair or a computer or a desk, and frankly doesn't achieve you know, much of the economic benefit that we were looking to achieve in this program. Much more important, I think, to take an aggregate look at the value of its tangible assets and ensure that that, that um, opportunities of business is at least investing as much just as you would in an analogous real estate example. And of course, in the real estate context, there's, there's I think, some practical applicability here as well. Uh, practically speaking, there are purchases all the time where, of, of a building, let's say an adjacent or adjoining parking lot, of which the building is going to receive a, a tremendous amount of improvement, but the parking lot won't, and there will be no economic case or business case to double the value of the parking lot, but you're still achieving the economic impact in that same area. So I think there's real reasons to get through the, the aggregate improvement test. I think the ADA laid out a, a, a very good way to do it in its um, comments, which I won't go into in detail because they did. Uh, but I think that that will be important to ensure there's investing in existing operating business in the opportunity zones, as well as practical investment in certain types of real estate projects. Uh, the, the second issue I think that's important, and I think we just need a minor clarification, is the treatment of the gross income test. So I, I, I think the IRS substantially, um, won't use that term, I think the U.S. Uh, greatly improved its treatment of the gross income test between the October and April regs, 
one small note, though, it, it, it used language that um, the gross income test applied to activity in the zone of the business, which implies to some in the marketplace that they can't have uh, opportunities on businesses that, that stretch across multiple zones. Of course, that would be the goal, to have large growth businesses that can grow across multiple opportunity zones um, and uh, businesses that meet the otherwise the other criteria. Uh, should be able to meet the gross income test across its assets across multiple zones. And I know my, my time is expiring, I'll just make one other quick comment. Um, and that is, uh, I think there's a question about whether qualified opportunity zone businesses can hold subsidiaries um, in their normal course of business and not be excluded from investment because of the non-qualified financial property test. Um, the way that reads is it would prevent partnership interest in subsidiaries. Of course, this would be a normal way of doing business as a qualified opportunity zone business or an investor in those businesses. And there should be a, a rule in place, and I think uh, EIG and others have laid out a, a practical scenario of evaluating if you're holding own that subsidiary, invest at least, or invest at least 50% of it, that it would not be treated against your non-qualified financial property test without allowing for subsidiaries to be invested in, I think you're going to limit the, the size and type of businesses that can be practically invested in throughout this program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clickman. Any comments from the panel? Otherwise, I'll turn it over to Mike. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be offended if Mr. Nubby did not. I know, you have a timeless. I, I assume that you're suggesting that there is a, a workable nexus rule for aggregation in the ABA comments that we should assume that you are. That, 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 that you're, you're lending your way to it. Uh, uh, yeah, of course there is. It relates to uh, assets in tracks or uh, adjoining tracks, contiguous tracks. Mike, are you done? Yep. No. <laughs> Uh, just one question, you talked about exotic structures, and you mentioned 1245 recapture. What if you could just elaborate on that? Are you thinking of a situation whereby if you sold the partnership interest, the 1245 recapture would escape tax, where if it's a sale of assets, you know, down one or two tiers, the 1245 would not escape tax. And then by virtue of that difference in rules, if I understand where you're going, there might be an exotic structure whereby you have a single asset fund such that the partnership interest could be sold. Am I following you correctly? Yeah, so it basically is the, just the difference of the language of 1250 and 1245 and how um, the regulations refer to the sale of single assets. They talk to the capital gains that, that then uh, the uh, investors would, would not be on the, on the hook for anymore. And, and in other parts of the statute, they talk about a whole step up in basis um, in, in the interest. Of course, capital gains works fine as a 1250 asset because it's considered capital gains. So you, you could add language that said you escape ordinary income or capital gains, which I think Nova Dragic has recommended. Uh, right now, a workaround is to allow for interest at the feeder fund level to these individual QOFs, and they hold individual, um, let's call them renewable energy assets. And uh, those uh, it, it could function in a similar way, but it's much more burdensome because then you have to collect your investment for each individual asset and then transfer those interests back up to the Peter Fund. And there's really no reason it should work differently from the real estate context. <coughs> My sense is it's an inadvertent wording difference that could be corrected with, a, with an update in that wording. Could, could, the, could the workaround also um, operate to eliminate all ordinary income, income other than 1245 recapture, such as sale of inventory? <coughs> Yeah, well, so I, I think in this case, you just you, the the focus will be on the sale of the the asset itself. So you're, you're going to be you're talking about selling what will, will most likely be an individual LLC containing the asset, and the uh, full uh, equivalent treatment to the full step up in basis um, of the value of that asset upon sale, so that there is no outstanding tax event on a non real estate asset. So I think the goal is to get to that same result, so that you don't have different results depending on the different types of assets that your qualified opportunities on the fund may own in the multi-asset vehicle. But just to be clear, if, if I start a widget-making business in a qualified opportunity zone, are you suggesting that the income from the sale of the inventory that we sold in the Okay. You're focusing your comments on the real estate aspects, the 1250 under capture, 1250 gain, and the 
12.45 p.m., just trying to figure out where you would draw the line as to what would be permissible to be eligible for the step up in basis. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's again, to treat them um, in the same way as, as uh, a sale on, um, uh, on the real estate components of those assets because it's the, you know, again, it's the, the core of this is the tangible property in the zone and the sale of those, those assets at the end of the holding period. We can follow up later. I'm just trying to, to, to understand whether the sale of the tangible could be extended to deal with a sale in bulk of a business that has a significant amount of other ordinary income assets, such as an And you're, you're not proposing that? I'm not. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sure. No, I just want to confirm that your first comment is you believe that people are sitting on the sidelines because of our applicability rule, what we did to give the lines. Yes, I think that's I think that's why some investors are seeing in the sidelines in the multi-asset fund context, which is I, I think will be the majority of the source of investment over time in this program because it, it creates the the structure that's most scalable. And that, and I I've talked to many investors that um, and many fund managers who are having trouble confirming to the investors that they can make sales. Um, individual asset sales, which is how most of these multi-asset funds are structured at the end of 10 years and provide them some kind of assurance that they're going to receive the tax treatment that they're expecting because of that language. And in part because that language is different than the language of, of the rest of the regulatory, uh, of the rest of the regulations that were released in April. And you're suggesting that what's necessary is reliance so that uh, a structure which is created today would be able to look back to the proposed regulations in 2046 and apply the terms of those regulations even if the final regulations are different. Well, correct, just just like... I, I, I yeah. want to make sure that we're communicating effectively. Yeah, we? yeah, no, correct. Just, just as you can anywhere else uh, it, that, that's laid out in the April regulations and they also have long-term consequences. Uh, and the reality is there are, there are now you know, a, a non, not a substantial amount of multi-asset funds in the marketplace that are having to essentially, you know, sell on a faith and a prayer that their analysis of where the rents are likely to end up, that the are going to avoid a tax event are in fact true. So everyone in the market is taking on some amount of liability in, in, in interacting with their investors and others that this structure and, and the tax treatment that they're committing to their investors will, will be there. I'm confident that's where the IRS plans to go, but that's that's not enough for many investors to feel like they can deploy capital now into the marketplace. Okay. Anybody? No? No? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. All right. Our next speaker, uh, we have two, Dan Cullen and Daryl Steinhaus from the Institute for Portfolio Alternatives. Daryl Steinhaus, I'm with BLA Piper. Dan Cullen and I are here representing the Institute for Portfolio Alternatives. And I want to go over a couple of issues today that I think we could improve the regulations and provide some additional guidance. The first is somewhat that Steve talked about before, which is aligning exit strategies. When we look at these transactions today, there's three ways you can get out of these deals. The investors can sell their units, you can have the qualified opportunity zone property sold, which are typically partnership interest, or you can sell the underlying business slash project. In most of the deals done today, we have a fund on top, we have a partnership below, and the partnership below owns right now typically a piece of real estate. And the problem is, depending on where you are, where I do fund formation, and uh, a lot of my clients are trying to uh, set up false and opportunity funds and in advising them there are a few um, ambiguities and uh, frankly potential issues that I was hoping to uh, bring to the panel attention respectfully. And um, I guess before I get into the two main topics I want to discuss, I just want to briefly touch on the, uh, the inside gain issues that a couple other panelists addressed. 
That's something that um, we've been wrestling with as well. I've actually been advising clients to set up parallel cloth structures uh, where there's still ambiguity in the rules uh, regarding how inside gain will be treated, especially where there can be 1245 recapture. Even for real estate investments, if you have you know, cost seg and some of the, some of the purchase prices uh, allocated to depreciable assets, you would run into the same issue even with the real property investment. So I would respectfully suggest that given that the statute operates by excluding all the gains in the investment held for 10 years by increasing the basis of fair market value, 1245 recapture is an element of that fair market value. And so at minimum, I think the final reg should address that. And in the context of uh, operating businesses, I respectfully suggest that um, uh, if, if um, the assets of the trader business in a section 1060 cents are sold, it would be appropriate to have a full exclusion for that, for the disposition of that investment. Um, the two main topics I wanted to discuss, one of which was touched on a little earlier by, uh, I think it was Mr. Gleckman, uh, regarding carried interest. Um, I have a slightly different take on that. Um, the position of the state bar and my personal position is I think it's completely appropriate for carried interest not to qualify for the uh, fair market value basis election and for a tax-free exclusion after 10 years because that amount does not represent an investment of capital gain. However, I think there's an issue in the proposed regs regarding how a partner's unitary capital account is apportioned as between a section that might represent a valid capital gain rollover versus a section, uh, a portion of the capital account that represents the carried interest. And the example that I bring to your attention, which is exceptionally common in the market, I think I would say most of the deals for, uh, for qualified opportunity fund offerings I work on have some kind of economic deal that's similar to this. You have a waterfall with multiple tiers. And in tier one of the waterfall, uh, well, let me just back up. Suppose the facts are that a sponsor co-invests with outside investors. The sponsor puts up, uh, let me just look at my example, 10% of the capital, and the investors put up 90%. And the deal is that uh, everyone gets an 8% return on their money, and only above that 8% IRR does the sponsor earn an incentive allocation to carry interest. And the way that works is the sponsor always gets his 10% of the profits, and the investors get their 90% of the profits up to an 8% IRR, and then any profits above that go 80-20 uh, in a typical deal. And the problem that we're encountering uh, is that you have two, at least two basic ways that the fund might be set up. Uh, you might have a general partner that makes that capital gain investment, which might be a perfectly good capital gain rollover, just like for the LPs. And then that general partner also gets an incentive allocation or you might have a separate management company that gets the incentive allocation, which might make perfectly good sense uh, for some business reasons, because you're giving some uh, incentive allocations to, uh, to different parties that rolled over capital gain, or there's Texas margin tax reasons, being a Texas lawyer, that's, um, that's probably a little uh, esoteric. But the point is that these two structures don't seem to be treated the same. Um, in particular, there's this concept of an uh, allocation percentage in the regs, which you can find as the uh, highest share of residual profits the mixed funds partner would receive with respect to the carry. And I'm not sure if this is intended, but at least the way we're all interpreting this uh, as practitioners is that that's a fixed number, and it's like the worst number for the carried interest person. Uh, and in the example I gave just now, under the facts I laid out, I believe, and correct me if my math is wrong, that that number is 64%. Because above the 8% hurdle, uh, that's where the highest, that, that's the only tier of the waterfall in which a carry, a carry is earned. And in that tier, uh, you know, for every $100 that's earned, 10 bucks goes to the sponsor for its capital interest, and 18 bucks goes to the sponsor as 20% of the other 90. And so out of the 28, 18 out of the 28, or 64%, is carried interest. And um, because the regs don't distinguish between profits that are earned above and below the hurdle, this appears, the way, the way a lot of us are reading it, to effectively convert part of the sponsor's 8% return on its capital, the same as, same as the money partners are getting, into a deemed carry that, that, um, that effectively causes the carry uh, I apologize for the metaphor, to 
almost feel like a cancer in your capital account. It causes, it you know, metastasizes and takes over parts of the capital account it really shouldn't. And as a result, if a single capital account represents both capital and carry, that's a bad structure. And that's a bad, uh, that's a bad way for a sponsor to invest. And so we've been advising clients to, uh, to go the route of having a separate carry vehicle and a separate capital account, which makes the rule in the regs effectively elective and a trap for the unwary. Um, so I guess we respectfully suggest that there's a number of ways this could be addressed. Uh, first, you could define the, uh, the allocation. Instead of using an allocation percentage concept, you could say, and in any event, the, the basis is measured not by the current, sorry, the step up is measured not by the current basis, but rather by the amount of deferred gains. So you seem to say, hey, if, if we if we can get the ten-year benefit by holding until uh, 2047, uh, even if we don't get deferral, why not do this? And I think that there were two suggestions that you made, one of which may have uh, more problem with the statute than the other. Okay. Uh, the idea that one could start the seven-year period or the five-year period uh, after 1231-26 uh, would have a problem because you get the benefit of that step up only if the investment in the crop uh, is, associ <coughs> is associated with a deferral election. And the deferral election couldn't be made uh, so that way. The, so uh, the other one, where you're saying, if I had a good deferral election earlier, maybe I should be able to continue to get my five or ten percent, five, ten percent, ten percent or five percent step up subsequent to twelve thirty one twenty six. As long as I started out okay, that one might have less trouble with the step. So actually, I wasn't necessarily tying the step up to the basis uh, for the 10%, 15% cumulative based on getting the deferral or not. All I was pointing out there was that also in the statute, um, in terms of the deferral, the 10-year deferral, that is actually statutorily defined to be December 31st, 2026, that be paid April 15th, 2027, whatever that tax rate is at that point in time. But unlike the sections that deal with the uh, 10 percent and then the extra 5 percent in the step up of basis, Congress did not put into the statute a time period. And because the proposed regulations were allowing up to the year 2047 for the Qualified Opportunity Fund to actually sell the property, and I assume that was done partly so that it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a fire sale because there's a bad market after you've been holding it for 10 or more years. Um, so too, uh, it would not be beyond your ability because you would not be, you're not constrained by the statute. Uh, it could be in your regulations to uh, also allow that sort of flexibility with the step up and gain of 10% and 5%. Um, because um, everywhere I go, at least when I listen to panels on the, uh, on the I'm gonna talk about the seven year uh, step up, in order to hit that, uh, it's always talked about, well, that would, that would mean that the investment has to be done before December 31st of this year. By. By, by December 31st of this year. And all I'm suggesting is, in your regulations, if you were to allow the same flexibility that you are for the sale of the Qualified Opportunity Fund to sell the property all the way to year 2047, if you allow that same flexibility, uh, then it, it, it would actually enhance, I think, the ability of qualified opportunity funds to go into qualified opportunity zones because they're not losing that seven percent, seven percent. They're not losing that um, that fifteen percent step up in basis over a period of seven years. No, I, I I understand that point that you're making. You seem to be making an additional point, which was that you would be able to get the five percent and seven percent even for uh, uh, investments into a clock subsequent to, I guess, the latest possible date would be uh, it would, no other than the, the, the sale that the, you'd be able to 
you can get to defer something that was sold on December 31st, 2026, maybe you could uh, make your investment as late as June of 2027, but beyond then, right. you would not have a valid deferral election, and therefore the 5% of the 10% uh, step-ups would be unavailable for investments that day. Well, correct, and also the zones themselves will automatically expire. Well, but we, yeah. we, we indicated that maybe For, even the, 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 since it, we didn't want to have a situation where virtually all, where we didn't, when, didn't want to have a situation where virtually all of the 10-year uh, basis benefits would be gone once the zones expire. Right. And we also didn't want to have a situation where we preserved the ability to get the step up. But uh, once the zones expired, uh, it was uh, that there were no continued requirements of complying with the economic focus in the zone. Uh, we uh, soft pedaled the consequences of that exploration. Yeah, and, and I think that's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. All right, our next speaker is Jill Holman from Javelin 19 Investments, LLC. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. All right, let's launch again. My name is Jill Holman, and I'm president of Javelin 19 Investments, a Washington, D.C.-based development and advisory firm. I have 15 years of experience in real estate acquisitions and development, and to date my firm has been involved with almost $200 million in qualified Opportunity Zone investments. I also serve on the board of directors of the Opportunity Zone Focused Trade Association, the Opportunity Zone Association of America. And since I last spoke to you on Valentine's Day, we have capitalized our Opportunity Zone student housing project in Baltimore, Maryland, and are poised to start construction. The project features what the OZ legislation envisioned uh, in fulfilling a need for housing for students in ways that positively impact the community. While you have my working group submission, in the interest of time, I will focus my remarks briefly on five quick subjects, most likely to unlock still hesitant investors. I appreciate the chance to speak with you. Uh, the first topic is qualification of already owned property. So many properties owned by taxpayers as of December 31st, 2017 are the subject of planned development extending into 2018 and beyond. Still unclear is whether a sale of that property is needed in order for work done with respect to such property to qualify as qualified opportunities of business property. Said differently, if a taxpayer has owned land or land and building prior to January 1st, 2018, can improvements to that land or land and building in 2018 or later qualify as QOZVP? The question is whether improvements funded by a QOF investment contribute a separate item of qualified property in situations where expenditures exceed 70% of the sum of the investor's basis in the already owned property and otherwise qualifying costs. The regulations could treat the pre-existing property as one asset owned by the QAF and its subsidiary entity and the improvements as another and analyze the substantially all tests with respect to these two assets. I can offer mathematically confirming examples, but I think you understand the points. Other tax credits and incentives specifically provide for the special asset treatment, and I wholeheartedly support this interpretation. The second topic is aggregating expenditures to satisfy the substantial improvement test. Under the proposed regulations, the substantial improvement test for used property is calculated on an asset by asset basis, eschewing the aggregation of related assets methodology. The statutory language which calls for expenditures with respect to the used property seems to more logically support an aggregating of eligible expenditures. <coughs> Consider a single owner who owns multiple residential buildings and land on the same parcel in the same opportunity zone and who has a comprehensive community-focused development plan to rehabilitate the buildings while adding a new playground for the younger residents and a new commercial area to satisfy the retail needs. 
These additions are clearly with respect to the existing buildings, but the current regulations would require that the rehabilitation meet the substantial improvement requirement on an individual basis. I recommend that the IRS adopt a regulation permitting the substantial improvement test to be passed for with three things. One, if a written development plan, which meets the substantial improvement test on an aggregate basis, including both the rehabilitation of the used buildings and the cost of new construction. Two, expenditures are made on contiguous properties. And three, the written plan is approved by a local governmental body responsible for authorizing development activities. The third topic is alternative methods of gain exclusion, and we've touched on this a bit before um, with the other speakers. Currently, dramatically different tax treatments result from the sale of a QAF, a QOZB, and a QOZBP. In fact, the selling of QOZBP appears to not yield any opportunities and tax benefits. I strongly urge the IRS to synthesize these three scenarios and explicitly allow for the sale of QOZBPs to produce the desired OZ tax benefits to its QAF investors. Right now, an OZ investor may achieve gain exclusion after 10 years only by selling its QAF interest. Gain exclusion is achieved by an investor election to increase the tax basis of the QAF, um, QAF interest to its fair market value immediately before the sale or exchange. If the QAF is a partnership, the proposed regulations also provide that the QAF increased its basis in the partnership by the same amount. This can benefit a QAF partnership that owns assets that otherwise would generate ordinary income upon disposition. But a different result occurs if the QAF sells its interest in the QOZB. In that instance, the proposed regulations provide that if a QAF partnership or S corporation recognizes gain upon the disposition of its QOZB investment, the investor has held its interest in the QAF for at least 10 years, may elect to exclude from income some or all of its share of such gain attributed to the qualifying investment. The election only permits the QAF investor to exclude from income capital gain from the result of the, from the sale of the qualified property. It does not specifically or explicitly apply to any ordinary income resulting from the qualifying sale, such as depreciation recapture. I appreciate that there's language in the proposed regulations to suggest that the 10-year asset sale applies to sale of property by a QCB, uh, but I do not believe that it explicitly states so. Most costs are being structured with subsidiary entities owning the underlying property. For business reasons, not tax reasons, most buyers prefer to purchase property assets rather than interest in entities which own the property. With these observations in mind, I recommend that the IRS exclude that the IRS extend the exclusion provision to the entirety of the sales of property held by the QAFs, not just capital gain, as well as the sale of QZBP held by subsidiary entities in which the QAF invests to the extent such gain is allocated to the QAF. And finally, the 10-year asset sale election is not one on with which the investors may rely. This chills many potential investors who make investment decisions based on certainty of tax results. Looking at dispositions 10 years or more into the future, investors are extremely reluctant to commit dollars today without having a sense of what the rules will be applied when they may dispose of the investment. Investors are being told the no tax after 10 years rule may apply um, and may be available depending on what the IRS ultimately decides with no particular commitment to publish a rule before their investment is made. The pro proposed regulations should be one in which the investor may rely. And fourth, triple net lease and active conduct of a trader business. The proposed regulations confirm that the business of leasing real estate can qualify as an active trader business for opportunities and pur purchase purposes. Treasury then muddied the waters a bit by saying, however, merely entering into a triple net lease is not enough to be the active conduct of a trader business. Opportunity zone investments are naturally aligned with the preservation and rehabilitation of communities' historically significant buildings and many rehabilitations supported by historic tax credits utilize a master lease structure for credit delivery. 
with the industry, with we in the industry are struggling, um, as I think you've heard, in the uncertainty of the word uh, mirror as Treasury used it and asked for guidance through the use of examples in clarifying language. Uh, for example, you could use Section 199A um, in the context of the qualified business income deduction. And for to keep it short, I won't read that. And fifth topic is QAF investor relief if proposed financing or other conditions fail. There are many uh, instances where an investor is admitted into a QAF, but the proceeds are not deployed into the project until certain conditions precedent are met. So the sponsor is comfortable or financially able to move forward with the on the OZ project. Satisfying these conditions may be subject to actions of third parties, force majeure, or the inability or ability of the developer to raise capital, equity, or receive the financing, in which case the sponsor of the QAF may choose to simply return the investor's money if they're not able to meet those conditions. Similar to reinvestment following dispositions, Treasury should allow taxpayers who have returned their gain investment dollars to no fault of their own 180 day window to reinvest into another QAF. Lastly, I know others are going to speak on the concern with the netting rule applicable to 1231 gains and losses. Um, we provided commentary on that as well and add my voice to um, reconsideration of that rule. And this concludes my remarks and I appreciate the opportunity to share with you today and on what I think will encourage more investments in the zone. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Jill, thank you. Very helpful points. Uh, just on the uh, ten, the dash two C ten year rule, would you envision a rule, as I asked the others, that would require a distribution of the proceeds in order to uh, for the QAF to avail itself of the ten year elimination? In other words, if, if there's a sale outside, mm -hmm. that's one thing. The investor has the cash, and the buyer of that can never get the benefit. Mm -hmm. So the question is, should you have parity between that and a situation where the sale inside? such that there would be a requirement to distribute the proceeds. Um, I think that is fair. Um, and ultimately, from a business perspective, I most investors that I've spoken with who are investing or considering investing significant amount of capital do not understand that there's different treatments at the different tiers. And I think whatever gets us to the parity and synthesizing those three outcomes, I'm fine with. If that means the distribution, I would be fine with that. Thank you. Right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, our next speaker is Regina Stodaker from Howard and Howard. Good afternoon, and thanks for having us back. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, one of you said this is a sacrifice of our time, and it's really it's really not it's really a really refreshing experience to have the opportunity to talk with all of you and to listen to all of our colleagues. So thank you for listening. Uh, my name is Regina Stodaker. I'm a partner with Howard and Howard Attorneys. I as well was back here on Valentine's Day. Um, and you are correct. There is a lot of energy um, in, in this space right now. We have established more than 20 opportunity funds in qualified opportunity zone investments. Um, frankly, it's, I think it's, 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 we were at 25 as of June 30th. Um, from everywhere from Las Vegas to Flint, Michigan. And what I'm bringing to you today are just a few of the challenges that we've noticed in setting up those structures. Um, and a couple, many of them have been addressed today, uh, so I'll try not to go into too deep on those comments specifically. But some of those uh, challenges, is, is the way I would describe them, would be with the debt finance distributions that appear to be trapped in the April regulations associated with the modified disguise sale rules. Uh, the use of tangible property outside OZ locations as it relates to qualified opportunity zone businesses. The ability to recycle gains, and we've talked about this a tad as it relates to um, the multi-asset funds, but the ability to recycle gains that are triggered from the sale of underlying assets during the 10-year holding period continues to be what we view as a very, um, uh, continues to be an area of, of great disparity in terms of investors that want to come into these funds as opposed to family offices that might be used, utilizing targeted investments to set up their own funds. So I think we're achieving different things um, by not allowing this recycling of gains within the 10-year hold period. 
Next would be the ability to utilize related party transactions. I haven't heard a comment on this uh, because it seems to be pretty settled in. But in working with family offices and closely held businesses, one of the things that we have identified, um, and these were not in my prepared comments, so I'm happy to prepare something separate on this, is that related party sales where businesses have sold out or bought out uh, family members or uh, individuals within that are related purely because of sibling relationships or other type of relationships, those are precluded from doing investments into opportunity zones um, in particular, what's interesting we're finding is that a lot of those same type of family offices are no longer, are not able now to contribute those gains <coughs> into high qualified community projects that would be unrelated to the transaction or the parties that created that related party gain. So I would compel you to give that some consideration. Um, and I also have two additional comments. I'm not much of a policy person, but I have, we have gotten comments back from many of our investors as it relates to the need for an intermediary to connect investors with projects and opportunity funds, essentially a matchmaker of sorts to put projects and investors together. I know this is not the time and place, but I bring it up that we are often asked about this very concept. We attempt to do that. We can't be part of the promote. That's not what we do. Um, but there is definitely a gap between the community and the investors in terms of how to find each other for qualified projects and investors looking for qualified projects. Lastly, um, we are working with some uh, social impact investment funds who are specifically looking for uh, advantages to invest in women-owned business and minority-owned businesses throughout Opportunity Zone locations. This is completely absent from the regulations. And again, I understand this is not your place, but I mentioned that in terms of if there could be a way to align other incentives for those types of entities within the Opportunity Zone legislation or, or an ability to coach the communities on how to, again, match make uh, some of these minority businesses and or women-owned businesses with investors, uh, I think aligning some of these incentives would make this legislation that much more powerful to people that have, need access to capital that don't currently have that. So uh, the debt finance distribution comment, I'll address that quickly. I know Mr. Cullen and a couple others addressed that comment. Um, I can speak to a specific example of an investor with a $48 million gain from 2018 that had a fund set, set up. We actually, um, as of the week before June 30th, abandoned that transaction for a large development in Minneapolis, specifically because of the new debt finance distribution language um, associated with the sky sale modification. That created a big problem. We had banks that were willing to take part of that transaction. And so I was very interested in the conversation earlier in terms of looking at what the third party market will do with an opportunity zone investment and their willingness to participate. And I think this is a perfect opportunity for us to enlist established banks that want to work with these developers and work with these investors to leverage that interest so that we can do distributions and then subsequent projects along with that in that structure. So I think that's one that definitely needs further contemplation. Um, and I did go into some more detail on my prepared comments on that. Um, second to that is the use of location, location of tangible property. Um, I think Mr. Glickman made comments regarding use. And we, again, this is one of the areas as it relates to qualified opportunity zone businesses where we're finding um, it's the 70% use of tangible property is a bit, uh, prohibitive as it relates to businesses with uh, mobile units, for example, uh, mechanical contracting companies with vehicles that run across the, the, the use of the tangible property is often used outside of the opportunity zone. So the 70% test of the tangible property creates a problem if we want to relocate or acquire a mechanical contracting company or even a technology company where they have portable laptops and things of that nature. So the ability to better utilize the testing uh, for businesses would be very helpful uh, if you really want to put headquarters and businesses in zones and still allow them to service their customers outside the zone. Uh, the last comment I, I would make, as I mentioned uh, earlier, is the gain rollover within the 10-year holding period. I won't address that anymore other than, again, stating that I think that is what's preventing multi-asset funds from really getting off the ground, at least in terms of our investment base and of the funds that we've set up. 
um, the inability to reinvest and have gain transactions throughout the life of the 10-year holding period seems to be the, the primary issue that investors are staying back and the lack of clarity around what would be that taxi, taxing event during the 10-year holding period. Uh, lastly, I would, again, from a policy standpoint, uh, just make the comment that we represent U.S. Hispanic, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and Executives from one of the only Latina SBICs in the country um, who serve to corporate sponsors such as the Billion Dollar Roundtable. And it's there where we feel that there is a need for additional incentive to support investments with minority, minority, minority business and women-owned businesses. So with that, I'll reserve the rest of my time for other speakers. Do you have a suggestion on the 70% use test, how we would clarify that? Yeah, I think um, I, I think there it's really looking to the the nature of the business really needs to be contemplated. And I, I keep going back to when we talk to our clients that look to the intent of the statute. And so it's it's really about the fact that if you go on an asset by asset basis test and do the testing, um, we we run afoul of that testing. So I would think something it really the percentage is, is challenging when when you think of a mechanical contracting business with let's just say 200 or so service professionals, and that I bring that one up just because it's, it's one that we're working on right now, where, where they actually construct a facility in, a, in an opportunity zone, and they have all of these vehicles that are out running around, and service professionals, and they do some business on water repair, frankly, in Flint, Michigan, and some outside of that, that zone. They will fall, fall outside of that 70% test, or fall beyond the 70% test as it relates to uh, their tangible asset, yet the heart of the company is in the zone. And that's where the revenues are, are generated and all of these others. So I don't, I think that the linkage of 70% to tangible assets is what the issue is. So I don't know if it's the amount as much as it is looking to the underlying business and what is really driving the business and why it's located in that zone. Gina, thank you for your comments. I wonder if we can drill down on that example. I want to make sure we're not missing something with, as some refer to it as the disguised sale rule. Mm -hmm. It's really a rule that limits the amount that's deemed invested. Look at the disguised sales rules as a handy mechanism for making mm -hmm. that determination. So if you could just tell us a little more about that fact pattern. So someone was going to invest $48 yeah. million? Yeah, so we had a $48 million gain transaction in 2018 that was ready to be deployed by June 30th, 2018. Just so let's call it an individual. Individual had $48 yeah. million of gain. It was a partnership. Okay, and that partnership was going to invest $48 million. Into an op their own opportunity fund and okay. invest into a new development in Minneapolis. Okay, so it was going to just put $48 million down. Yes. And then yeah, financing lined up. Financing lined up with a single bank that has banked them for a number of right. years. And that bank was going to loan money to the QA. Exactly. And interestingly, looking to the underlying asset, which would right. be the new development. Right. And was there an intended distribution of some of those proceeds? That's where we got caught up, right? There was an intended distribution initially because they roll over and do additional investments. So so just to, to drill down. It's really the two year period that's the issue. Well, it's a disguised sale analysis. Yeah. So if you get comfortable under the normal facts and circumstances rule of the disguised sale rules, then you get comfortable with this. But within a short period of time, where they're going to distribute, say, half of that amount. So 48 million was, was invested. Were they going to borrow 24 and distribute it out immediately? You know what's interesting about that is it wasn't and that part of the plan was not defined. It was the normal business process would have been for there to be a distribution. But out of normal so, operating, yeah, but, but there under the sky sale It rules. could have been as much as half, yes. It could have been in terms of if we, if the question being, what would the plan have been? Because we abandoned it, it would have been as much as mm -hmm. half of the 48 million yeah. to go back. Yeah, just, just so I don't, I'm not missing an obvious point here. The, the, the source of the proceeds, say of 24, that would be distributed, the source was, was it the borrowing, was it operations or a combination thereof? Uh, it would have been the borrowing itself, yes. Yeah. And that was prearranged from day one. More yes, and what's interesting about that project specifically is that the they have a track record of developing projects within 12 to 24, in fact, they do government contracts. And so they have you know, defined projects that must be constructed within a period of time. 
Um, so their project would have been completed before the end of this year, which is why the bank was very comfortable with that transaction. So, so in our mind, it's all about there being economic substance to the underlying transaction right. that makes that. So our request is, if, if the way it's currently written, it appears that there's a presumption of a disguise sale. And if we can get over there being a presumption of a disguise sale, I think we could have gotten them comfortable. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, it's not a, we're not within the disguise sale rules. That's the mechanic for purposes of determining the amount of the qualifying investment. So 48 was going to go in, and maybe we can clarify this, and, and thank you for your, your comments. If 48 goes in, and let's say there's a prearranged deal with the bank to borrow 24 and immediately distribute that out, what the rules intended to deal with is to uh, take the $48 million investment and say that if this would be a disguise sale based on the rules we put in the regs, then the $24 million distribution would actually reduce the amount of the qualifying investment. It would have no impact on the underlying fund. It would just say that effectively you put in 24 and the other 24 came from borrowing so it would, again it would just winnow down the amount of the investment that's all it's intended yeah and what's unfortunate about that the way it resulted for us is that instead of doing then the call it up pre fund what they did is split it up between some 1031 and other transactions but otherwise they were looking to do probably with that 48 probably three oz developments mm -hmm. right but instead they they didn't have the clarity, at least we weren't able to find the clarity that they needed to be able to pull it out without that being treated as, uh, you know, not eligible uh, gain. Okay, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> sorry. Um, just want to make sure that I'm not missing uh, an opportunity. Um, your concern about uh, the uh, transaction between siblings mm -hmm. and the sibling with the gain would like to invest in a qualified opportunity trust. Uh, that would appear to be facially inconsistent with the statute. Do we have anything that would let us satisfy what we need? I don't see it there either, yeah. Um, I think it's an unfortunate result. Well, I understand the intention of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not saying that it's a perfect statute, yeah. um, but um, in terms of where we have elbow room to try to accommodate things that everybody would like to see, um, when the statute is this clear, that doesn't seem to be a constructive use of our brain power to try to figure your way around. Uh, the next, uh, the idea of uh, essentially the crop being a little bit like an IRA mm -hmm. in terms of uh, Re, uh, re deployment of assets into their most economically productive uh, location. Uh, it's great economics, but the, unless there is a, in general, an explicit uh, provision that realized gain does not get recognized, mm -hmm. as there is with IRA. As there is with a variety of other cases where Congress, they, they want it to be tax free, they know how to say it. And uh, there doesn't seem to be a, uh, uh, an opening here for that, however desirable you feel it would be, other than our saying to act with a code. Uh, is there a, an option that we could go with other than ignoring uh, the realization? Well, you know, we've, we've given that some thought as well in terms of the way that the step up and basis works for the first seven years. Um, if there would be some corollary to even a recovery of basis on that second investment as opposed to a complete um, non-recognition of gain, that would be the only, you know, that would be a mechanism that would allow that could demonstrate there could be some recycling of the original. So you, you're suggesting that the uh, the basis step up would get sacrificed, and that extra basis could sort of go in and, and shield some gain. Yes. Yeah. And then finally, um, is there something that we have done that makes the ozone incentive? less hospitable than it could otherwise be to these other goals. In other words, we tried 
uh, to make it available to a variety of other kinds of uh, taxpayers. Uh, uh, example, REITs and RICs, we can imagine a REIT being a, uh, a plot uh, for the life of me. I can't see how a RIC could be, but we put that in there as a possibility. Uh, uh, Litex is the absence of a back end gain, uh, which, is, which would be an unusual development for a real estate investment that has a minimum 30 year affordability commitment and maybe 45 in some locations. Uh, is there anything that we have done that makes this regime less hospitable than it could be? Or is it simply that we haven't uh, manhandled uh, the natural consequences in the sense that this would be more, more to your liking? Uh, I don't, I, I think, again, I come back to the spirit of the legislation in, in when I, when we are looking at advising our clients. So I, I definitely am hearing your comments in the regulations about the spirit of legislation. And that's where I can find comfort with our clients in terms of steering them in the right direction. It's when we get into some of the particulars of I, I understand that. <laughs> uh, but I, I think it's when we get into the nuances and the traps that aren't, aren't obvious that then three months go by trying to figure out what's the right answer and now we've lost another year of an investment. So I think to the extent that we can embrace the spirit of legislation and, and I'm not concerned about the table sitting here, we're all concerned about ten, you know, five, seven, and 10 years from now you know, sitting in front of an IRS exam and having to explain spirit of the intent was appropriate, and yet it's being inter interpreted differently. Well, right? I mean, we will try to make it explicit when we are able to further the intent with, within the constraints of the code. Uh, but uh, the basic structure was uh, given to us by mm -hmm. the enactment. And limit some things we might otherwise want to do. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maurice Daniel of Economic Inclusion Task Force. to speak to you today. Uh, my name is Maurice Daniel. Uh, I am here as a replacement for my colleague Moses Boyd, who was originally scheduled to, to give this presentation, but he had unforeseen uh, travel complications. So um, I am a poor substitute, but I am here nonetheless. Um, Moses and I are, are a part of uh, the Economic Inclusion Task Force a stakeholder group whose aim is to see the proper uh, implementation of the Opportunity Zone legislation. Uh, we're committed to assisting the rollout of this new investment tool um, that was, of course, created by the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Um, we are, um, the Economic Task Force is composed of African American men and women entrepreneurs uh, formed following the White House formed following the White House meeting with Vice President Pence and U.S. Senator Tim Scott in the spring of 2017. Uh, the Economic Task Force advocates for advocating the economic growth in urban, in urban communities, and we have worked hard uh, for the passage of the Opportunity Zone legislation. We believe then, as we believe now strongly and resolutely, that the Opportunity Zone law for the first time in decades opens the door for much needed uh, major capital investments in the urban, rural, and heavily African-American concentrated communities. In this regard, we are keenly interested in two uh, vital goals. Ensuring that the program operates to the benefit of the intended communities, and ensuring that there's significant diverse participation at every level of the program, including at the fund formation levels, ownership and management levels, 
and into business enterprises that will be the subject and the recipients of these capital investments. The specifics of the Treasury's uh, regulations are crucial to achieving these outcomes. We write to express our support for certain provisions that we believe are critical to these objectives, and we applaud Treasury for its tremendous work in implementing uh, the regulations for advancing this law. We also believe that the Department has, um, has achieved much needed progress in clarification manners that are providing more confidence to investors who are eager to engage in this new uh, national investment. <coughs> However, we do remain uh, concerned about uh, uh, several issues. The regulations regarding the uh, investment in, op in operating businesses and substantial improvement tests and the proposed 31 month um, requirement for determining uh, active trade or businesses. Regulating uh, regulations uh, regarding investments in operating businesses and the substantial improvement test application. This issue uh, concerns the determination of substantial improvement tests either on an asset by asset basis or on an aggregate basis. The department uh, notice of propo proposed rulemaking indicates that this test will be applied on an asset by asset, asset, by asset basis. However, um, given the nature of the target communities and what it's going to take to attract um, capital and uh, realize successful investments in these communities, it is vital that the department allow for uh, meeting the 30 month substantial improvement test on an aggregate basis as opposed to an asset by asset basis. For example, if a crop determines to build a health care business park in a qualified opportunity zones, the assets will likely include adjoining commercial structures and parking lots. On an asset by asset basis, each of these assets would have to meet the tests individually. However, no rational investment strategy would operate this way. Only allowing for accounting on an aggregate basis do we believe that such investments are more likely. The proposed 31 month requirement for determining an active trade or business. The, uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking suggests that the new investment and the new operating businesses that are acquired must be an active trade or business after 31 months of the deployment of capital. However, given that these investments are incurring in distressed and in many ways nascent markets for the purpose of major um, private capital investments, it is highly probable that it's going to take longer than 31 months before such an enterprise fully really meets the test of an active trade or business. Consequently, we agree with the position of others who commented on this issue that the department strongly allow for the satisfaction of this requirement in the event um, clear evidence of advancement of the investment toward an active trade or business has been made and all the other safe harbor requirements for the deployment of capital have been met. I would like to raise one other point uh, as it relates to uh, concerns that have been expressed to our group from local community groups, uh, local organizations, and uh, NGOs who play a strong role in attracting investments in these targeted areas. They've struggled with achieving clarity from the complex regulations in a plain language manner. They're concerned about finding what they need in the regulations, understanding what they find, and being able to interpret what they find to meet their needs. Uh, we at the Economic Inclusion Task Force would ask that the regulators uh, consider these concerns in the future of financial improvement. And so we need help deciding when a, an aggregation rule, if we were to adopt one, should uh, be uh, accommodated so that it really is meaningful in terms of substantially improving a particular asset, even if we don't do it on an asset by asset basis. So uh, we, we need that, that help. And uh, uh, the uh, we try to write as clearly as we can, but we have to write technically and specifically. And uh, we hope that others, such as your organization, can have 
experts like you who can read it and can then help translate it to the people that are making it work. Right. Certainly appreciate the dilemma. Um, if you restrictions that you are operating within and uh, don't take them lightly. Um, we always go to the mission of the legislation is, is our guiding, guiding light. And um, I don't know if I have all the answers, but I know that is an answer and we're willing to work very closely with um, the regulators to thank you. To, on that. Thank you. We have Sarah Brundage from the Enterprise Community Partners. Hello, my name is Sarah Brundage. I'm the Senior Director of Public Policy for Enterprise Community Partners. And on behalf of Enterprise, I want to thank uh, you for this opportunity to offer comments. Enterprise is a leading provider of the development capital and expertise it takes to create decent, affordable homes and rebuild communities. Since 1982, we have raised and invested $43.7 billion in equity grants and loans to help build and preserve nearly 585,000 affordable homes in diverse thriving communities. And Enterprise is launching our own family of qualified opportunity funds intended to advance equitable and inclusive growth in the communities where investments are made. To ensure the tax benefit fulfills its intent, Enterprise recommends that the IRS modify proposed regulations to one, clarify the treatment of vacant land to prevent land banking, two, encourage pairing with the low income housing tax credit and new markets tax credits, and three, implement requirements to collect and publicly share meaningful data on qualified opportunity fund investments. To the first point regarding the treatment of vacant land to prevent land banking, we believe that subtracting the value of land from qualified opportunity zone property for purposes of the substantial improvement test would be conducive to efforts to preserve affordable housing. However, that same provision could unintentionally result in predatory land banking and long-term land holding. Such an outcome would contradict the goal of making improvements to acquire QSE property. This is particularly true in areas experiencing rapidly rising costs and the potential for abuse would be especially problematic in the case of land that is vacant, significantly underdeveloped, or with significantly <coughs> depreciating assets. We therefore recommend that the IRS clarify that in the circumstance where property is being used for low-income housing tax credit properties, the requirement to substantially improve property comply with Section 42 requirements, which are 20%, and with the exception of circumstances with the housing credit, we recommend that the IRS provide a threshold above which land would have to be substantially improved, regardless of any assets or buildings on the property. Um, without such clarification, it is impossible that investors will be able to receive, it is possible that investors would be able to receive a significant tax benefit for holding valuable land for 10 years without making improvements. And um, I imagine that you might ask me what a specific number for such a threshold would be. And Enterprise did not provide a specific number. However, we would be happy to default, default to our partners at Nova Braddock, who are speaking after me, but I believe also recommended that at least 20% as well. On the second point, Enterprise believes that the true potential of opportunity zones lies in the, the ability to pair this new source of private capital with existing programs to generate social impact. In particular, the low-income housing tax credit and the new markets tax credit are proven powerful tools with long track records and community revitalization. This round of proposed regulations included provisions that could inhibit the, ability, the industry's ability to pair these tools, however. The original legislation allows investors to select between paying the tax on either the original deferred capital gain or the fair market value of the qualified opportunity zone investment in 2026. However, the proposed regulations differ from the original legislation and instead require investors to elect between paying the tax on either the original deferred capital or the capital gain that would result from the sale or transfer of the QZ investment. So we strongly urge the IRS to ensure the viability of pairing these incentives and in particular ask uh, that the IRS clarify that the fair market value excluding debt plus any cash flow distributions to investors be the standard for calculating a deferred tax bill in 2026 for long-term housing tax credit projects. And we believe clarification on these regulations would allow housing credit projects to compete with market rate projects and help us maximize the impact that we can have in low-income communities by leveraging other federal programs. 
We also recommend adjustments to the proposed regulation stating that the actual corporate subsidiary with the capital gain has to be the one that makes an investment in a QOF. Uh, this could be problematic for banks that invest in housing credits through a community development corporation, but which may have capital gains in another corporate affiliate. Therefore, we recommend that the IRS allow taxpayers investing in qualified opportunity funds that then invest in low-income housing tax credit partnerships to use capital gains from consolidated affiliates of the taxpayer. Lastly, we once again urge the IRS to collect and publicly share meaningful data on QF investments. We thank the Treasury for its prior RFI on data collection and tracking for qualified opportunity zones, which we are very pleased to provide our recommendations to. We believe the collection and public reporting of meaningful data on QFs and their investments into designated opportunity zones are critical first steps towards ensuring that the Opportunity Zones tax incentive is fulfilling its intended purpose. We provided detailed recommendations on reporting requirements that we hope you take into consideration. So with that, thank you. We appreciate your time and consideration. Thank you. Any questions? No questions. Uh, two things. One, uh, Is there something other than debt finance, the debt finance issue, which you think we could do to facilitate pairing uh, the uh, tax incentive here with uh, Vitex and, and MTC? Yeah, good question. Um, so as I stated, I'm on our public policy team and we ask this of our loan fund team and as it has been proving difficult at times to pair the two, and this was the only technical recommendation that we were able to identify. Okay, because when, when we looked at it, one of the things we noticed was that uh, there are some of the benefits that many people get excited about for ozone, which I would be surprised if Vitek investors were looking forward to it. Uh, and uh, I'm less of a person who would work with new markets, but I think that there were also um, changes. There, 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 there were aspects which it didn't seem to be. Uh, there, there were at least no low-hanging fruit and maybe no fruit for how to do that. The other ones, in terms of what the amount to be included in 2026 is, uh, I assume that you would not say that the op could load up with debt distribute that out, uh, do so because of the basis bump from the debt, and there would be no income to the investor. And then the historic deferred amount would be reduced close to zero because um, of the presence of the obligation of the debt. And that didn't seem to be something that we would think you would be advocating, and I don't think it is really consistent with what the yeah, goal of that twenty five cents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bob, this is another goal set. So, in other words, uh, the the heartache, if I can call it that, which is produced by looking at what would be the result of getting rid of the debt that is internal to the entity is the necessary concomitant of a generous rule which allows, at least after that first two years, a uh, distribution without tax based on the predicated, the, the the tax-free nature of that distribution would be predicated on the basis that is derived from the internal borrowing. Mm -hmm. And the, I'm willing to bet that we are not getting requests saying that we'd give up the ability to make those distributions if you would give us a 
uh, net of debt uh, rule for 2026? Yes, yeah, that would be, that is not our intent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, so uh, next up is John Charetti from Novogratz Opportunity Zones Working Group. And once John is done, we're going to take a 10 minute break. Um, I just think we, we need one. Um, and also, then we, anybody that has got airplane that you had to things like that, come up and let us know. Okay. Yeah. You're up, John. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Shreddy from Nova Braddock and Company, and today I'm representing the Nova Braddock Opportunity Zone Working Group. Um, on behalf of the working group, we are pleased and want to thank you for our opportunity to give our testimony today. Today I'm going to discuss three topics, none of which are original, going 13, um, but uh, I, I think it's great that we're aligned in our interest today. So uh, the three topics I will be discussing will be um, the special amount includable rule in the case of an inclusion event for investments in co-op partnerships and, and desk works. Uh, the second topic is the special 10-year exclusion election, which has been talked about a lot today. And then lastly, I'll talk about a grace period for quas and <clears throat> quas bees uh, to use property in, in the trader business. So with respect to the special amount includable rule, um, just a little <clears throat> overview, um, the regulations provide a special rule for an inclusion event, the, the inclusion amount with respect to pass throughs. Um, it's a little different than the statutory provision in that um, in the statutory provision, um, you take the lesser of fair market value will remain deferred gain, less less the basis in the investment. Where with pass-throughs, you you take the lesser of the amount of deferred gain, less basis, or um, or the uh, gain that would be recognized on a fully taxable disposition of the investment. We understand why this rule was proposed, um, that it's intended to prevent taxpayers from avoiding recognizing uh, deferred gain when the fair market value of their investment is diminished due to debt finance distributions. That's, that's what we understand why the rule was presented. However, um, as Sarah indicated, it is adversely affecting investment in affordable housing and other high impact community investments. Um, where the 10-year gain exclusion, as Mike's referred to, um, it is not is generally less valuable to them as they don't expect to have appreciation in their investment or much appreciation in their investment at the end of 10 years. However, they were pretty excited about the 2026 inclusion rule, the statutory rule, because it did provide value and that they could recognize this sort of typical loss in value over time at a certain date. So it gave them an accretion in basis. And in my experience of working with a lot of these low income housing investors, they were excited. We, we were able to, we were seeing non-traditional investors come to the table um, and you know, a lot of plans were being made for fun with syndicators and the like. Um, and as soon as the proposed regs came out, it's been quiet. You know, folks have sort of um, walked away or stepped back from, from the opportunity zone. And so um, as a result, I think a lot of aspiring investors have actually turned away from, from the program. And so we're recommending, as I think Sarah referred to, we're aligned in this, that that we make the inclusion rule in 2026 uh, consistent with the mechanics of statutory rule, um, but that we add back, um, that we, uh, that we, that we uh, modify the definition of fair market value and that we use the net value of investment, excluding debt, and then add to that distributions that were made. So these distributions that folks may have made to reduce the value of their investment, we propose that we add these distributions back, which we think um, prevents this artificial reduction in investment um, without adversely affecting affordable housing and other community impact type investments in these zones. 
that's our first first uh, issue. The second issue is with respect to the 10-year exclusion election, which, as I said, many people presented this issue today, and that um, this proposed rule um, only applies to capital gains, um, and only applies to the sale of property by a co-op, not, not business. Um, it excludes gains realized from the sale of property that's characterized as ordinary income, like 1245 depreciation we captured. And it also excludes any gains that are attributable to the sale of property at the business level. And so it's it's not on the same page. Um, we think that the rules should be synthesized with with the rule for selling your co-op interest, um, where all gains attributable to the appreciation of property, all property, whether capital or ordinary, or whether the property is held by the co-op or the business are eligible for exclusion. Um, it's common, as has been said much today, it's common for, especially in multi-asset funds, to exit by selling assets. Um, there's also likely to be a significant amount of operating businesses that will sell assets that produce ordinary gains. We, we see that in the market, especially in the renewable energy um, space. And then because most of the qualified opportunity zone property, in our experience, is going to be held by a business, not the co-op, simply because we have this flexibility of time to make our investment with the working capital rule, um, we think that it's important that, um, that we synthesize these two rules and expand the gain exclusion to apply to all gains attributable to the sale of any property used in a trader business by a co-op or quasi, with the exception of inventory or assets that are um, held for sale in the ordinary course of business, such as inventory. Um, that was our recommendation. And then lastly, which was sort of handed on today, um, with respect to a grace period for quaffs and quasbies on the use of property in the trader business. And, it, and generally, I think folks have talked about it grace period for a qualified opportunity zone business to become a business. And the statute does sort of um, uh, allude to that in that the statute says that new businesses must be organized for the purpose of being an opportunity zone business. So they're acknowledging that there is sort of this startup period at the business level. Um, but we know that qualified opportunity zone business property must be used in a trader business to be considered qualified. And we do have some sort of um, uh, some safe harbor within the working capital safe harbor that allows you to sort of treat tangible property as existing even before you bought it. But there's really no discussion on use, and there's no discussion on how much time a business gets used to property. Um, so if a fund invests in equipment, let's say, and um, you know there's a period of time before they can actually put that in production. You know, is that disqualified property at that point in time, or do they actually have to have it in production? Or even in the case of real estate, where if a business kind of satisfies the safe harbor, but in 31 months it's not placed in service yet, um, and so do they fail the qualified opportunity zone property at that at that stage um, because it's not placed in service yet? So we think that um, we think that Treasury should consider. Um, a rule where um, a business is not treated as failing to satisfy the use requirements solely because the tangible property is not used in a trade or business before a reasonable startup period. That's sort of all businesses are different. It's probably you know 12 months might be good for some, but some may be a different based on the nature of the business. And so, so before a reasonable startup period, based on the facts and circumstances, is sort of what we're recommended that um, a business should have time before they have to use their property. Alternatively, if you do want to provide a safe harbor, provide that businesses have 12 months, but that 12 months doesn't stop, start until after the 31 months. So that's our suggestion. And we're really suggesting this both at the co-op and the quasi level, um, because even at the co-op level, we have to use this property in a trade business. So that uh, completes my testimony today on behalf of the working group. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> I'm going to go first, actually, this time. Okay. Thank you, John, for your comments. Uh, there's one thing that keeps popping up for me. I was on a panel with John, with uh, Mr. Novogratik, um, and there seems to be a lot of push to have sort of special rules for affordable housing area, just to make them work. I know Jill talked about historic credits, and I've been asked about new markets. So I don't know if someone could provide me just, or provide all of us, something with specific rules that you're looking for just for this industry because it keeps it keeps coming up and there it, it's all over the place uh, well, in I different that, parts I mean, of the right yeah i mean in my experience i think affordable housing worked well with this program at least certain types of affordable you know bond probably work better than the four percent works probably better than nine percent but um i think that Investors are sort of relying on the fact that they are losing value in their investment. And, and the benefit that they don't get at the end of 10 years, they can sort of accelerate this loss in value in 2026. And and it provided enough incentive to encourage non traditional investors in the place. Because we saw it happen. I mean, were, there were people were pretty excited about it. And so it's, it's not what you can do to help, it's what you did do to hurt. By giving us well, that, that's, that so, rule, you know, and I think if you modify that rule, and I understand why you did that rule, because generally folks could reduce the value of their investment by taking distributions before 2026. And so we suggested one way to modify that. Um, there may be some other ways that don't hurt folks, um, you know, that are that are not trying to lose the value of the investment, but naturally the value may. You know, not be appreciating at least at 2026. I mean, the reason why I asked is um, Mike and I are very familiar with this space, mm -hmm. but a lot of us, on the rest of us on the panel and uh, decision makers might not be so familiar with the space. And so it, I think it would be helpful to highlight yeah. those issues. That's the one thing I can think about, but I think it's, um, it's something that as a working group, we could convene and come up with um, some written response. Answer that question. Thank uh, thanks, John. Two really quick hits. Uh, first, on the calculation of the gain, I just want to make sure I'm understanding where you're coming from. But suppose I invest 100 or roll over 100 or whatever term you want to use. So my outside basis is 100. I look at the statute, you look at the deferred gain, 100 bucks over the basis. Wait, 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 what? I, I have 100 of gain that I outside. Have, outside. Zero. Yeah. Right. So my outside right. basis is zero, but yeah. I put 100 in. So if I turn around and it was suddenly 12, 31, 26, putting aside the 10 and 5% bump ups, I'd have to pay tax in the 100 of gain. Okay. So I want to make sure I understand where you're coming from with the borrowing. If, if my gain is 100 and it's tied into that gain less the basis, and there's a borrowing without a debt finance distribution, I am now going to have a basis in my partnership interest of $100, right? Because if there's a borrowing, there's a borrowing 100 of which is allocated to me, 100 of borrowing is allocated to me. Right, on the inside. A borrow is $100 a borrow that's allocated to me. Yeah, yeah, so that's yeah that's correct. That's so now I have deferred gain of 100, yeah. I have a basis of 100 in my partnership interest, right? And I don't think you're suggesting it, but I just want clarification. One way to read the statute literally is to say the excess of the gain deferred 100 over the basis of 100 is the amount you pick up on 1231.26. No, I think you have to go net net on that. Okay, so and you move it back out the basis. Yeah, okay, and right. so the, the question really is um, when you walk through your calculation of adding back distributions and so on, is that written in your testimony? It is. Okay, good. We can look at that. Okay, and then back to the same old question uh, on the dash 2C 10 year rule. It sounds like you're trying to get parity between a sale outside and a sale inside, right? Except that to the extent there's uh, any of the gain is attributable to property held primarily for sale, on a sale outside, that clearly would be excluded, it seems. That's but inside, it would not be. That's right. Right. So you're, you're not looking for total parity. Not total parity. I mean, you could always just make a big inventory sale after 10 years and right, right, right. exclude it. You know? Right. And, and again, I've asked others, but would you be in favor of a rule that would require a distribution in order to avail yourself of the benefits of the 10 year rule for sales inside? Yeah. The first time I thought about that is when you asked others. And I'm trying to figure out. Well, other than creating parity, yeah. 
What else does that? Yeah, exactly. It doesn't solve anything. Right? Just one yeah. procedure. Right, right. Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay. Thanks. So we have five more speakers. Um, and so our next speakers are uh, Joseph Darby and Christina Rice from the Boston University School of Law, my hometown. Right, Professor Adams is, is in the eyes. decided not to have a look like you. The mom is the pompous. Anyway, uh, my name is Jay Darby, I'm a tax attorney. Proud of it. On behalf of uh, Boston University uh, School of Law. Uh, we're going to make a presentation. Uh, joining me is, is uh, Christina Rice, who's the director of the Graduate Tax Program, the Alabama Program at School of Law. Also joining us is uh, Professor Susan Atlas, who uh, helped uh, pull the, uh, the solution together. Uh, we teach at BU the uh, but I'm positive is that the first uh, fully full credit uh, course uh, specializes exclusively in Opportunity Zone wow. uh, Act. You know, because you send it yourself. <laughs> we <will. laughs> oh, we're, we're, we're making it as we go, but uh, it's the first semester, obviously. Modifying it after. You know. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> you'll appreciate this. I, uh, I, I was, I was, you know, helping with the, with the ABA and with uh, the Nova Grad Group and. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, the real estate roundtable, all answering questions. Every senator, you know, these are things the treasury specifically asked for comments on. It's a long list. And I said, "This is perfect. My work is done." So I sent it out to the students. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody picked a question to answer, and so we got back you know, 12, 12 answers from twelve students. We put it together in uh, uh, forty-eight hours. It's got a few typos in there, but uh, it, was, it was a ton of fun. So we're going to talk about a, a bunch of things fairly quickly. I'm going to talk about uh, twelve thirty-one, which is a, a particular important issue that I've been sort of, you know, advocating for in every group I've been part of. And then uh, Christine is going to talk about vacant land. I'll come back and do kind of a, a drive-by, uh, you know, presentation of those topics. Uh, the, the 1231 issue you're familiar with, uh, the, um, uh, the treatment of capital gain came up in the first set of regulations and was treated in a very, very you know, generous, reasonable way with the special rules for partnerships. Uh, the 1231 rules kind of uh, uh, create a lot of, a lot of stress and tension. Uh, in the in the in the real world marketplace, I have uh, two people who, in, you know, uh, rolling which is what 1231 is all about, but the 2026 rule is fine anyway. Really, there's a, a forbearance of the tax until uh, you know December 31, 2026. So I think that that rule is solvable and it's pretty necessary. It's just a lot of transactions where people are, are having you know, this you know, capital gain in 1231 in the same day. They literally don't even have an overlapping day in the, in the year where they can invest it into, into a one other thing I'll teach you, I'll, 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 I'll comment on this because the, the teacher is uh, people don't know the difference between uh, capital gain and 1231 gain. They don't understand what, what, what really is the nuance between it. They have a, uh, there, there aren't that many kinds of property that actually produce 1231 gain. Real estate does, tangible property almost never does. You buy a machine which goes down and down and out. Uh, the only other kind of property you see besides uh, a real estate that goes up in value is typically uh, intellectual property, patents and the like, and uh, teach taxation of uh, intellectual property to you. And uh, I can tell you that patents can be ordinary assets, capital assets, or 1231 assets, depending on who, who created them or how they're acquired. And the fact that a patent can have three, all three characterizations just speaks to the fact that having complicated distinctions between 1231 property and 1221 capital assets strikes me as, as, as going to only cause creation. Uh, people are going to make mistakes all the time. I'm not just talking about taxpayers. I'm really talking about, you know, tax advisors, tax professionals who are, you know, at the moderate to the low to mid, middle levels of practice aren't going to really know the difference. So it doesn't make any sense to have a, a distinction. It's only going to cause non-compliance on a massive scale. So that's my thoughts on 1231. Let me have a one and comment on the, on the vacant land issues. Um, so I will be representing the, the students in this class. I am sort of a quasi-student myself, uh, uh, talking about the uh, vacant property. So the second set of proposed regulations provided that vacant structures or other tangible property other than land will satisfy the original use requirement if the properties have been vacant or abandoned for at least five years. We agree that some quantifiable minimum period of vacancy is necessary to prevent potential abuse of this favorable guidance allowing vacant property to qualify as original use property. However, 
We believe an uninterrupted period of five years is unnecessarily long, and that a shorter period of one year is sufficient to achieve the anti-abuse goals. There is also a strong public policy need to reduce this period. Cities and towns across the U.S. have recognized the negative impacts of vacant and abandoned properties, including increases in crime and vandalism, decreases in surrounding property values, increased risks to health and welfare, and escalating municipal government costs. We cite several studies in our report that have found a correlation between the length of vacancy and increased crime, decreased property values, and higher municipal government costs. Local government officials, community organizations, and residents across the country recognize the value in putting vacant land and abandoned properties back into productive use as quickly as possible. It's extremely doubtful that property owners who held vacant property prior to designation of zones in early 2018 intentionally arranged vacancy with any future tax incentive in mind. We therefore recommend that Treasury adopt a standard similar to that applicable to enterprise zones, which states that if property is vacant for at least one year, period, including the date of zone designation, use prior to that period is disregarded for purposes of determining original use. For property that was not unused or vacant before the designation of the tract as a qualified opportunity zone, we anticipate that few, if any, property owners intentionally sought to make otherwise productive properties vacant in 2018 or 2019 in expectation of favorable treatment, uh, especially in light of the proposed five-year rule put forth by Treasury in the second guidance. Therefore, we think a one-year rule is also appropriate for property that became unused or vacant after 2017. To the extent that a prospective one-year rule provides an incentive to abandon property, it will be mitigated by the reduction in tax benefits for anyone waiting at least one year from the issuance of final regulations to act on a vacancy strategy. There is a trade-off in policy objectives in this case, and we favor a policy that helps rescue vacant buildings to the greatest extent possible. Okay, and then as they're showing on the, on the TV game shows, this is the lightning round. Um, you know, uh, quick uh, comments. Unimproved land, I thought you guys did a great job. Uh, 162 is the exact right uh, way to test whether it's being pulled in and used in a good way. It's not being held for a, you know, a, a, an investment asset that's being used. A quick observation, you were concerned about uh, somebody buying uh, uh, agricultural property, you know, growing grapes or whatever, doing the exact same thing, you know, hasn't really done much to improve. I agree with that as well. I think there's two things you could do as an addendum. One is it has to be used in the trader business. And then either it has to be a different trader business, I meaning you're, you're taking you know, flat you know, farmland tree into parking lots or swimming pools or something else, or uh, there's some level of improvement. And, the, and you had a, a good standard with improvements that are not insignificant. Uh, I think you're probably having some kind of safe harbor. It's a minimum of 20% is a safe harbor. But a facts and circumstances test. For people, as you pointed out with, with uh, land in general, there's all kinds of reasons people acquire it and use it. Is this a bona fide use to acquire it and put it into, a, into an overall improvement to the community? I think that that was extremely well handled. That's the only sort of small tweak I'd make there. Uh, on um, uh, uh, leasing rules, you, you nailed it. The leasing rules are fabulous. The only thing I'd, I'd comment there is that uh, on the market rate lease, you proposed a 42 standard. I wouldn't use 42 for unrelated parties. As you pointed out about real estate, there's a very diversified world out there. If people are at arm's length negotiating a lease relationship, it should be respected. I did agree with you on, on the 12-month on the minimum maximum on, on prepaid leases for related parties and the other rule for related parties. I thought all those rules plus the alternative valuation method were just absolutely perfect. Uh, on the uh, trader business issue uh, under uh, 162, uh, I think uh, you're wrestling with the like everybody else is because 162 is the right standard for trader business. Um, the active conduct is a, is, a, is a ringer for all of us. It gets pulled in out of 1397C. It isn't even in the Ozone Act anywhere. The active trader business gets pulled in by reference to 1397C, which itself doesn't define what the active trader business is. Just to start off, thinking it's, it's ridiculous as it could possibly be. You got a range of stuff. It could be the, the very low threshold of the new markets credit, which says basically any effort to make a profit, basically, is an active trader business. Uh, Gozone has got a much higher thing on net. I think net, triple net leasing is really the uh, the, the, where it is. I think 162 is the standard, and we look at the hazard case and the general counsel memorandum 38799. The IRS has acknowledged it's a very low threshold to turn 
leasing plus a little bit more into, a, into an active business for tax purposes. If that's where we end up, that's okay. It's just that the, 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 the issue of, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be quiet. Uh, the the, uh, uh, the the merely uh, merely engaging triple net leasing has got everybody sort of rattled that you can't do triple net leasing. You can identify I think 162 is the standard, so it's it's triple net leasing plus a little bit more. The that make the that make the world turn in the uh, in the leasing world. Thank you very much for giving us the time. Thank you. Any questions for the panel? Just one thing. quick question on the 1231 issue. Yes. Uh, one of the uh, pain points, I guess you would call it, you have been hearing about, is that uh, if the uh, seven-year uh, basis bump is available only prior to 1231-26, uh, we were hearing from a lot of folks that uh, having only one day on which one can make uh, investments uh, with respect to 1231 gain deferral that would be available for uh, the seven-year benefit was uh, pretty tight. <coughs> uh, some of your predecessors uh, at that podium have suggested that uh, the seven-year and five-year benefits could appropriately within the statute uh, be available beyond 2026, even though the deferral had ended. Uh, to what extent would that relieve the part of the challenge with the 1231 uh, timing question? It, it wouldn't relieve your concern about uh, the capital gains and, and 1231 gains being uh, triggered the same day, but having very different one day, one hundred eight day period. Yeah, I, I don't really see that as the as the driver of this issue. Uh, there, there's two kinds of gains in this world: capital gains and 1231 gains, and they're both gigantic amounts in the, in the potentially trillions of dollars. And having them have gr dramatically different rules, and, and I will guarantee you, people can't tell the difference. They ordinary taxpayers forget. Every one of them told me they sold a capital asset and it was real estate. Okay, pretty cool real estate. Well, it wasn't. It was 1231. And so I, I talked to accountants and go, oh, yeah, that's right. You know, and the accountants aren't are even that sharp on Okay, so we're going to have mistakes all over the place. The logic of being able to, to treat them consistently, I think, is in the statute as a sale of property, of both properties sold by a taxpayer and an unrelated party. So that's why I really advocate. We're going to have a lot of errors otherwise. So somebody who uh, has a 1231 game, let's say, in the first half of the year, mm -hmm. Uh, makes the uh, investment in the crop within 180 days, which will be four year end. Right. If it turns out when they're filing their return that they don't have capital, that they have some 1231 losses and therefore <coughs> their net 1231 gain is less than uh, what they had thought they were going to have, uh, they simply cannot defer that much. They will end up with a mixed investment, that's okay. You know, I like uh, I like having the 1231 gain be eligible because it says in the statute you, you, you had it exactly right on capital assets. When you sell them, you have 180 days from the date of sale. And that's just clear in the statute. It's clear it's a asset by asset sale. Same rule because they want to drive capital into investments and opportunity zones. It's already a slow enough train as it is. You got 180 days plus you got the QO level plus the QO CD level of 31 months. But you know, being able to invest it. Uh, as, as, as quickly as people want to after they have they recognize a gain event and roll it over is the right way to start it rather than push it as much as a year later. And I think that the, the, the logic of it is, I'm not so worried about the net, I mean, we, we, the net capital gains and capital losses, and we're not worried about the fact you may have you know, less capital gain at the end of the year than the amount you invest from a specific disposition. Likewise with 1231, if you have a 1231 loss, uh, you can claim it, but again, I'm proposing, first of all, you've got a five-year wait, any, any capital, any uh, 1231 gain you recognize for the next five years is converted to ordinary gain. And I, I think it's entirely appropriate to say, uh, if you have 1231 losses in a year when you roll over 1231 gains, you know, you effectively instead of netting it and then rolling over the, 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 the lesser amount, just have it be recaptured as, as 1231 gain in 2026 and extend the loss rule uh, you know, but by your election, you agree to be subject to the, the loss recapture in the 1231C. 
through December 31, 2026. It all matches up. It really does nicely. So your, your proposal basically is that 1231 gains be treated the same as capital gains. Exactly the same. Uh, regardless the regardless of whether or not for that year there was uh, only a penny of net loss or net gain. That's right. And the cap, it, 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 it reconciles uh, December 31st, 2026. If, if you had uh, 1231 losses and got very losses, you'll recapture this ordinary gain. Which is exactly what the call 31C would do, which is very kind of deferral. They recognize deferral throughout the, uh, the concept of the, of the first of the three tax benefits. It comes back being recaptured in the right character at the right time. So I think that that's a fair move for all of us. They'll drive deals. It really will make things happen. Thank you very, very much. Any else? Thank you. Okay. Oh, I think we're good. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is John Lanthier from EIG Opportunity Zones Polar Shop. Good afternoon now. Seems like just yesterday we were together on Valentine's Day, so it's great to see everybody again. Thanks for having me back. Uh, my name is John Lanthier. I'm the president and co-founder of the Economic Innovation Group, a bipartisan research and advocacy organization. We were deeply involved in the uh, idea behind Opportunity Zones and work closely with the policymakers to get it passed. We have a deep interest in uh, today's proceedings. Uh, EIG also works with a broad coalition of stakeholders around the country, uh, and it's that work that's important in the detailed comment letter that we submitted uh, in response to the latest proposed rules. I want to speak to some of those recommendations here today. Uh, and one of the casualties of being, I think, 15th in the lineup is that it has all been said. So I'll try to skip over pieces that are particularly redundant, but also emphasize a few things that I think are particularly important. Uh, first, I just want to take a step back. I, I think we're already seeing the fact that Opportunity Zones is a unique opportunity, uh, to overuse that word, uh, to make progress in expanding uh, uh, beneficial outcomes and economic activity for low-income residents around the country. And even today, as we sit here, without full regulatory clarity, this policy is already supporting investments as wide-ranging as clean energy investments, affordable workforce housing, manufacturing companies, agribusiness, uh, food startups, technology incubators, uh, and the list goes on and on. And I think that speaks to some of the potential of this policy, particularly once we have regulatory clarity and a mature marketplace. But it also underscores why uh, this proceeding is so important. It's to one of the questions that was asked earlier, if we want investment to go far and wide, around the map, if we wanted to go to non-traditional places, and if we wanted to go into deals that are particularly difficult to execute, uh, the rules are going to have a lot to say about how much risk investors are going to take to committing their capital over a 10-year period or more, uh, particularly in areas that are disinvested and, and have a struggle with long-term decline. Uh, so the work you do and are doing is critical to expanding that map of investment and economic opportunity, and we commend you on work you've done so far. Uh, so, as I mentioned, while the incentive was designed to support a wide array of uh, needs across communities, we believe its central purpose really was to facilitate investment in local operating businesses, particularly new ventures and existing small and medium-sized local businesses uh, in need of growth. This central goal must be thoroughly reflected in the final rulemaking in order for opportunity zones to achieve the success that they could achieve over the next decade. To this end, the second round of proposed regulations made enormous strides in addressing key structural questions and definitional issues particularly those related to operating business investment that have been holding back the formation of the Opportunity Zones marketplace uh, nationwide. So our coalition applauds the efforts of Treasury and the IRS to resolve a wide range of complex issues uh, so that Opportunity Zones can work as intended. Uh, for example, the proposed safe harbors for the gross income test, the extension of the working capital safe harbor, provide much greater certainty for operating businesses and will serve the underlying goals of the statute quite well, we believe. However, I want to focus my comments on areas we believe require additional clarification in the final regulations. So I want to get up front. We were very pleased and thought uh, the second round did an exceptionally good job of addressing many of the key questions. So don't take these comments as anything but let's just narrow the playing field down to the issues we can really require some additional attention. Uh, because the second tranche of proposed rules covers so much ground, most of the recommendations I'll make today really amount to relatively small technical clarifications or tweaks, uh, minor refinements and clarifications, but I hasten to add, while relatively minor in scope and complexity, these changes are nevertheless critical uh, to the real-world success of this policy and the communities depending on it. First, I want to talk about the substantial improvement test. 
Uh, this is a central feature, as you know, of the Opportunity Zone statute. Uh, its purpose is to ensure that investments made under this incentive lead to new value creation and new economic activity in the designated areas. In the preamble, Treasury asked for comments on the advantages and disadvantages of applying this test on an aggregate rather than asset by asset basis. As many others have already commented, we believe the aggregate basis test approach has many practical advantages and is consistent with the meaning and purpose of the statute. It is also consistent with the manner in which businesses actually expand their operations in the real world. On the contrary, the asset by asset approach is deeply impractical. We believe it would impose massive and unnecessary costs <coughs> and would reduce the economic benefits to the designated communities by discouraging investment in those local businesses. So we believe strongly that the final rule should adopt a substantial improvement test on an aggregate basis. There's perhaps no more important uh, unresolved issue to our minds to date uh, than this one. It will otherwise be nearly impossible for operating businesses to satisfy a substantial improvement test. So we recommend two potential safe harbors, as has, I believe, the ADA and other commenters uh, in our comment letter that reflect the real-world utility of an aggregate basis test. First, assets purchased as part of the same investment decision and located within the same track or contiguous tracks should be treated as an aggregate asset for the substantial improvement test. Second, for either operating or real estate businesses, assets that are operated as an integrated unit should be aggregated. Next is time and flexibility. Uh, this is a key issue for the practical application of this policy uh, in terms of raising capital from investors, deploying capital into qualifying investments, and returning capital to investors after exiting investments held for 10 years or more. Uh, while the six-month exemption period for new received capital included in NPRM uh, is a big step in the right direction, we recommend extending the six-month period to at least 12 months, uh, which is particularly important for the formation of multi-asset funds. In the same vein, funds need time to wind down and liquidate their investments after 10 years. And guidance should permit opportunity funds sufficient time to do so without facing the penalty for failure to meet the 90% asset test. We provide detailed recommendations in our comment letter on how to do this. Next is non-qualifying property. Clarity is needed regarding the history of non-qualifying property for the purposes of the 70% substantial threshold. For example, many projects contain some modest amount of non-qualifying property, such as land or a structure that was purchased before 2018, or purchased from a related party, or pre-acquisition development cost incurred by a related party and capitalized to the property. We do not believe that the presence of non-qualifying property should taint the entire project, but rather should generally be treated as a separate asset for the purposes of a substantially level threshold. In addition, if property is overwhelmingly improved, we support treating it as entirely new original use property. In our comment letter, we discuss a potential 80-20 standard and safeguards for achieving this. Next is the working capital safe harbor. Our coalition is supportive of the proposed regulation, uh, regulation's expansion of the 31-month working capital safe harbor to include activities related to the development of a trade or business. We raised two issues in our comment letter that we urge you to consider with respect to this safe harbor. First, the extension provided for delays related to governmental action is welcome, but should be broadened further to provide relief for other events beyond the business's control, such as natural disasters, delays in obtaining permitting or licenses, supply shortages, and so on. Second, we ask the Treasury to clarify in the final regulations that an active trader business need not exist at the end of the first 31 month safe harbor, but rather as long as the clause business is making progress towards the active trader, uh, active trader business and is still within the safe harbor, it satisfies the requirements outlined in the statute. I'm going to skip over 1231 gains because I associate myself with everybody else's comments on this. It's a big issue, it's a big concern, uh, and we hope that you'll uh, take a close look at that. Uh, look, uh, next, I want to look at uh, Quas Business Subsidiary Sales. Uh, we applaud the proposed regulations providing clarity on the ability to exit Opportunity Fund investments after 10 years, either by selling Opportunity Fund interest or assets. However, the additional clarity, additional clarity is needed for the assets sold by the lower tier opportunities on business. We suggest extending both the rule permitting sales of assets by the Opportunity Fund and the rule protecting against hot asset treatment to assets held by the lower tier opportunities on business. In addition, we strongly agree on the need for the proposed rules to permit reliance on the exit rules. This is uh, a big issue that is holding back formation of multi-asset funds. Uh, lastly, I want to touch on two things, reporting requirements and anti-abuse rules. Uh, while not the scope of the NPRM in question today, I want to note that we appreciate the Treasury's issuance of the RFI and reporting requirements and urge the adoption of data collection framework to govern opportunity fund investments uh, and to track those over time. We believe such reporting requirements are essential uh, in preserving the integrity and demonstrating the efficacy of opportunities over the coming decade and beyond. And lastly, we support the use of broad anti-abuse rules to ensure the integrity of the emerging opportunities on the market 
Uh, and note that these rules should be sufficiently clear so as not to discourage real economic investment in low-income communities. Our comment letter includes several recommendations to curb <coughs> while providing clarity to investors that they are in compliance. For example, we believe that final regulation should require that a greater percentage, 90%, of the tangible property owned or leased by a real property clause business must either be located within an opportunity zone or contiguous to an opportunity zone. This 90% threshold would be in addition to the 70% asset test, which would remain otherwise unchanged for all purposes of the section. And this would help ensure that the economic activity of real estate businesses is truly benefiting the opportunities on the surrounding area. So in conclusion, our coalition recognizes and appreciates the hard work of the IRS and Treasury in establishing a regulatory framework for this nascent policy. We look forward to answering your questions. Thanks. Any comments? No? We're good? Great. Thanks very much. Next up, we have Mark Kropp from the State Economic Development Executives. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Mark Tropy. I work with the Center for Regional Economic Competitiveness in Arlington, Virginia, and I'm here representing the State Economic Development Executive Network, or the SEDE uh, SEED Network. The network is made up of top state economic development leaders from across the country who gather on a bipartisan basis to discuss issues of mutual interest. And it won't surprise you one bit to hear that uh, they're very interested as one of the top priorities in uh, learning about and being involved in engaging their states in the opportunities that come with opportunity zones. At your February hearing, um, the SEED Network was represented by Stephen Pryor, uh, who was from Rhode Island, Secretary of Commerce, and Kurt Foreman, the president and CEO of the Delaware Prosperity Partnership. Uh, the SEED Network did submit a letter um, commenting on the second tranche of uh, proposed guidance. It was signed by 16 state um, economic development directors. And um, today I'll summary, summarize some of the um, comments that were submitted. And, and going number 16 on the day, it really does feel like uh, some of it is gonna be repetitive, but I'll, I'll, I wanna make sure to emphasize um, these five points in particular that they thought were um, especially important. And I wanna add that um, while some of the SEED Network's membership had the privilege to select opportunity zones in their respective states, and others had, in, had inherited the zones from a prior uh, administration, um, all of them are equally uh, um, uh, and actively, uh, eagerly engaged in working on uh, operationalizing the Opportunity Zone program. Um, in, in, um, in the main, we would like to express today the network's hope for changes that enable the program to serve both real estate development and the fostering of operating businesses. And a number of other folks have stressed that, that point in particular. Um, it's critical to make sure we, that the regulations um, uh, support attracting investment to both. So the five main points that, um, that we wanted to convey. Number one, the rule should provide additional flexibility in determining whether the substantial improvement requirement has been met through applying the requirement on an aggregate basis. Um, the preamble in the proposed regs provide that um, the requirement is determined on an asset by asset basis. Uh, the determination um, of the requirement on an asset by asset basis rather than aggregated may especially burden uh, operating businesses. And this could make the um, uh, ozone investment process uh, difficult in ways that were not necessarily intended. We encourage that the substantial uh, improvement requirement be applied on an aggregate basis. Um, rather than asset by asset basis uh, with respect to operating businesses, uh, which we expect will decrease the burden for those operating businesses. Number two, uh, the rule should provide sufficient flexibility for opportunity funds to reinvest interim, gain, interim gains in qualified opportunity zone property in a timely manner without incurring a penalty or triggering a taxable event. Uh, the proposed regs provide that the proceeds from the sale of uh, qualified opportunities on property that generates gains may then be reinvested, but the gain is first subjected to uh, income tax. And while we understand that the regs indicated the IRS uh, doesn't have the regulatory authority to exempt those gains, we strongly encourage re, uh, revisiting the issue because we're concerned, we remain concerned, that present, preventing opportunity funds from reinvesting capital proceeds from the sale of qualified stock and partnership interests without triggering a taxable event 
would reduce the incentive for opportunity funds to invest in operating businesses specifically. Under the draft regs, the incentive for opportunity funds to invest in operating businesses could be diminished due to the taxation of those interim gains, even if the gains are reinvested into uh, uh, qualifying ozone properties. And some states have noted among our members that the current regulations treatment of interim gains has significantly curtailed interest in their states in investment in operating businesses when compared to uh, interest that's being expressed uh, and shown in real estate investment. This topic was raised by the network in previous comments. Um, we, we believe that the regulations should reflect the kind of basic investment practices where a diverse portfolio of investments is, is wise, there's an ebb and flow to the investment. Uh, we're particularly concerned that opportunity funds be given the ability to reinvest capital proceeds from the sale of qualified stock and partnership interests in ozone businesses without <coughs> triggering the taxable event. Future regs or modifications to the regs could provide further flexibility for uh, opportunity funds to reinvest interim gains in qualified ozone property in a timely manner without subjecting investors to income tax on such gains. Number three, the rule should provide sufficient flexibility for new opportunity funds to meet the requirements of the 90% asset requirement. Allowing recently contributed property a minimum of 12 months before it counts against the 90% asset requirement would provide additional flexibility for funds to thoughtfully establish their investment uh, portfolios. And under the proposed rules, an opportunity fund may apply the 90% asset requirement without considering any investment received in the preceding six months. In practice, this means that a fund has a minimum of six and a maximum of 12 months to deploy new capital raised before being subjected to a possible uh, penalty for failure to satisfy the requirement. In a typical investment timeline, it takes a fund a minimum of 18 to 30 months to raise capital for investors and to appropriately deploy it across the balance portfolio. So um, the network is very grateful that the most recent tranche of regulatory guidance provides a degree of flexibility uh, with respect to cash held by an opportunity fund uh, regarding the 90 day, 9% asset requirement, as well as the flexibility that the 31 month working capital uh, safe harbor provides as well. However, as we stated in earlier comments, we recommend a change to allow a minimum of 12 months for investments to be made before incurring a penalty under the 90% asset requirement. And we ask that you consider extending the option to disregard recently contributed property to contributions or exchanges that occurred not more than 12 months before the test was <coughs> being excluded, rather than the six months in the current regs. Uh, establishing a minimum of 12 months for those investments to be made. While the working capital safe harbor is beneficial to newly established funds, this suggested change would also afford multi-asset funds additional flexibility and allow for a more realistic investment timeline for the funds. Number four, uh, the rules should encourage meaningful but unobtrusive public reporting requirements for, for costs. And um, you know, due to the unique aspects of the program, it's important to track the efficacy of opportunity zones and identify areas of improvement and modification for the future. Uh, so we suggest that opportunity funds be required to provide a set of, uh, of simple information enough to give the public confidence um, about the initiative. We encourage the adoption of um, some simple reporting requirements to collect data on funds and their investments. Uh, in our December um, 2018 letter, uh, we proposed that they be required to report at least uh, on the specific opportunity zones in which uh, there is capital deployed, the amount of capital deployed, the eventual appreciation of that capital. Um, beyond that, we're very interested in the RFI process uh, and the responses that come forward in that, and we look forward to, um, to some of the insights that those responses may provide. Uh, last but not least, uh, under additional opportunities, one issue that we did not address in our written comments um, but some states have more recently raised as a potential area for improvement. Um, and I know there's many other groups uh, that have also submitted written comments that focus on how the regulations could better encourage affordable housing development. And while the network has not recommended specific regulatory changes, uh, we support creative approaches that would enable investment in affordable housing projects and make it easier for uh, opportunity funds to invest in uh, LIHTC projects. Some states have expressed concern that there may be issues with the regs around compatibility with the development of low-income housing 
And so um, the Seed Network would encourage you to explore this, and we would be very interested in having further dialogue with you on that particular topic. Um, in closing, uh, the census tracts were selected because they are, in many cases, struggling, facing <coughs> challenges, and attracting investment. Uh, it is extremely important to the network that we recognize uh, that the important that the purpose of the program is to attract investment, uh, both for real estate and for operating businesses, and that the regulations support both purposes. And we really appreciate the progress that we've seen in subsequent versions of the regs, and um, and uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to share the thoughts of our network with you here today. Ready? Any questions? What fortuitous limitations do you see that we should address in connection with pairing uh, the ozone incentive with the uh, So this is an issue that has just come to our attention in, in recent days, and I would be happy to talk with the members in the states that have uh, expressed those concerns to come back with some specific uh, uh, items. I noticed you raised that earlier um, today, so we'll check with some of our members and get back to you on that. Chris? You had mentioned that uh, you were looking on the 90% the test on the, on the initial testing date going from six months to 12 months. But then I think you also said, or at least I wrote down, that, that it takes an average of 18 to 30 months to, to actually deploy capital in many cases. Is, is 12 months going to be sufficient, or is it like in combination with the working capital rule that, that will end up being sufficient? Good question. Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I um, you know, our members um, expressed the concern that 12 months would be more you know, the, the sentiment that 12 months would be certainly more workable. Cer certainly, it's more flexible. Right. 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 Will it be sufficient? We didn't we didn't broach that. Okay. Yeah. I'd be happy to get feedback <laughs> on that point as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, number 17, Clayton Wyatt of the Alliant Asset Management Company, LLC. Good afternoon. Something great about being in a uh, auditorium with no cell service for five hours a month. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I know you all better, so. Um, we're happy to be here. Uh, my name's Clayton White, I'm Chief Cap Officer of the Alliant Company. Um, one of our affiliates is Alliance Strategic Investments. Uh, our partner, Eddie Long, is here. We've, we've been following this legislation very closely as part of that connect, the EIG group and the Democratic Working Group. And so we, we echo those statements that were given earlier. And um, I'll keep this very quick because I know we're, we're very close to being done here. Uh, there was a couple things that we just wanted to highlight. And, and a quick background on Alliance is we're a 20 year um, plus tax credit syndicate. We've been in the light tech business as an asset manager, developer, fund manager, and now these, these preservation funds and, and the funds in the opportunity zones um, are of particular interest. So we we actually, I think, have done the, the first, if not one of the first, tax credit ozone deals, which we've done in Florida with a, a bank. We were lucky enough to have an investor partner in SunTrust that had an episodic gain um, from a division that they had sold. So they had a capital gain that they could put in and we actually structured it. We, we, did, we, we don't see that as the norm. And unfortunately in the regs, you know, the type of gains that these banks are going to have is not gonna qualify for, for investment. So, you know, I know there was a couple options that were given earlier and some ideas. We'd love to, you know, converse a little bit more on, on ideas on how to attract banks in because I do think that it's a big miss if we don't have banks that are interested in investing in these areas. So one of those areas we wanted to hit, I know it's not necessarily in the purveyance here or in the scope of what you guys can do, but the CRA credit, if there was a way to attract these banks in by getting them CRA credit in these areas, I think that would, do, that would go very far um, for helping to attract more capital into this space. So the other two items I wanted to cover was on impact reporting and then on the, the substantial improvement um, test. Again, um, you know, I think this has been covered generally here, but one of the things that that we really feel strongly about as a, an affordable housing developer and tax credit syndicator is that the one of the most impactful investments you can make is to give 
residents in these areas a safe, a clean, um, you know, place to live that they can afford. And so, as part of that, I think that requiring, uh, you know, some sort of reporting um, at, a, at a project level would be very helpful, uh, which should include things like the address, uh, the number of units that were created um, at an affordable level, population that's served, and the average incomes of the residents that occupy those those units. Um, as, as far as the you know drawing the banks, and again, I think as, as I mentioned under CRA, you know banks have, have been a driving force in the tax credit um, housing space, and unfortunately, we don't see them coming into the space at scale. Um, that's going to be episodic at best, and so I think if we can figure out, and I know. Again, this isn't a letter to you guys, but being able to get that CRI credit would, would, would go a long ways. Um, and then lastly, just to hit the, the substantial improvement test as relates to existing multifamily housing. Um, it's been very difficult, as you would imagine, to substantially improve an existing property. And unfortunately, that's a lot of the product that actually needs some of the improvement. These are you know, old buildings that have a high occupancy, and even though you could come in and do a very large improvement, you're not gonna probably spend 100% of what you bought these properties for. So if there was a way to, under the um, change of use rule, to figure out that you could take an unrestricted multifamily housing project and change the use by putting in use restriction on that property, and you could do that through the form of a land use restriction, so if, if you could have a LURA, and again, this is done negotiated with local and state levels, but if there was a template for that nationally that could come, quote unquote, off the shelf, and we could apply that to existing unrestricted properties, and under the, the statute and, and the definition of change of use, restrict the use on that property, and then you wouldn't have to spend 100% of the, the property that you purchased, I think you could create and preserve a lot more units in, in these areas. Uh, I, I echo the, the statement about the, the aggregate test on substantial improvement. There's definitely opportunities where you could go buy a property with some adjacent land and put a new building on that land and, and operate those two buildings as one unit and qualify the aggregate test. But being able to do something a little bit more creative where we can take the existing housing stock where you don't want to remove tenants in a building for five years or even one year to qualify, that would that would really open up what we call this naturally occurring affordable housing or NOAA so that we could use the existing housing stock that we have. Um, I'll, I'll stop there if there's any questions. Um, in terms of attracting ozone investment, by having CRA, um, I had been under the impression that because financial institutions can never get capital gain from the sale or exchange of a debt instrument, they have very, very little opportunity ever to have capital gain. So are you talking about investment that gets CRA even if it gets none of the ozone incentives. Correct. Or so, if, is it, you know, as you may know, as a tax credit syndicator, we have you know economic funds and we have CRA driven funds, and so we see that banks will invest for that CRA need, and particularly in certain areas where it's difficult for them to get that that requirement met. So, if there was a, and if, again, I go back to this land use restriction. If we could have a template that was off the shelf, so if you say you're creating housing in these areas, and maybe you're serving 60 to 120 percent of AMI, and you have this use restriction that would meet the you know the regulators' threshold. I I truly believe banks would invest just for that without getting the benefit of the the OZ, um, incentives. They would invest to meet the the need of their CRA requirement. I see. So. You, you aren't suggesting that somehow we uh, find some subset of banks gain from the sale of the debt, uh, which we would say 
wonderful, but it's not to be treated as if it has no. I mean, listen, sure. if, there's a, if there's a way to do that, it absolutely would help. I think this could be an easier way to do that. That might be lower hanging fruit. But we can't control CRA. Agreed. But you asked the question. Okay. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Just real quick on your issue of unrestricted versus restricted use. I mean, my thought was always that we could deal with this at a local level, that they would be doing it for zoning. But what you're asking is for a national level. Yeah, the, the problem that we've seen, and we've taken existing properties, um, we're working on one here in the DC area, where we're trying to put a use restriction on the building. And, and that helps, you know, from our investor base, helps for a, a number of things, for our impact, you know, mission. And, but, it's it's hard to negotiate on a one-off basis what that use restriction is and so again having this generic template that banks would have confidence in knowing that if this template is set on this building it's just efficient it's quicker it's easier uh, it just becomes a standard as a lot of these things that we know early you've seen investors that are hesitant to invest because there is no standard there's a lot of uncertainty eliminate some of that uncertainty with a standard that can be duplicated and used over and over Anybody else? Great, thanks. All right, thank you very much. Last but not least, Julia Gordon from the National Community Stabilization Trust. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today and it is sort of fitting that I go last because I'm going to talk about the thing that is either last or non-present in conversations about opportunity zones, which is single family residential housing, particularly in the homeownership context. Uh, my organization, the National Community Stabilization Trust, focuses exclusively on single family residential properties in distressed neighborhoods nationally with an enormous amount of overlap with opportunity zones. We've been doing this for 10 years. During that time, we have facilitated the transfer of 26,000 vacant residential properties and put them back into productive use, mostly for home ownership, some for affordable rental. So that's where, uh, that's where we're coming from. Um, typically, when I testify, I, like many of the folks you've heard of today, am a subject matter expert, and I can talk statutes and regs with anybody. I come to you today to say, I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't do LIHEC. We don't have any tax credits, um, you know, beyond, I guess, the mid, which doesn't really apply to the affordable folks that we deal with. Um, we, don't, we don't have a tax credit program that helps us finance the acquisition and rehab of these properties. Um, when we saw opportunity zones happen, it was not a conversation we had been in previously, and it is a conversation that's taking us a long time to figure out how to break into. Um, but we are hoping two things. First, we would love to find a way for these funds to provide the kind of well-priced capital to our developers that make the difference between being able to do this rehab and not do this rehab. Um, but if we can't achieve that, we want to, uh, we want to advance the principle of first do no harm. So I want to speak a little bit to some of what we're already seeing as what may be some unintended consequences of the Opportunity Zones program. We are seeing basically a speculative land grab in Opportunity Zones. And we are seeing that that is not um, confined only to either commercial or multifamily rental properties. We're seeing it in the single family context too. Uh, if you look at Zillow prices, you'll see that in Opportunity Zones, you've seen something like a 20% rise in home values or, you know, Zillow generated home values for what it's worth, in those neighborhoods. New behavior in opportunity zones. For example, they're seeing tax lien holders 
foreclose on these liens at unprecedented rates within an opportunity zone when that behavior isn't changing outside the opportunity zone. So we are, um, we're a little bit on alert about this whole thing. Um, something that may not be that familiar to you because it's not what you do every day is that since the financial crisis in 2008, not only did we see close to 10 million home foreclosures on families, but the vast majority of those properties have never become reoccupied by an owner occupant. They, are, they have transformed into single family rental properties. The single family rental industry has, has become turbocharged in the last decade. Um, it's being uh, helped along not, you know, not only by the fact of all of these foreclosures and the availability um, of those properties in sort of the normal course of business events, but by massive sales of pools of distressed mortgages by FHA, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac, by technology advances that have enabled investors to purchase residential properties without ever seeing them and without living anywhere near them. You can have, you know, I can tell you stories about people with laptops in China buying properties from the Detroit Land Bank and then they find someone to go look at the property and they're like, can we give it back? Um, so th this is um, this is really threatening to us. Everything that folks are trying to do to try to advance the interests of affordable home ownership. Um, I don't need to tell the folks here that home ownership and the extent of home ownership in a neighborhood can often be the difference between successful revitalization versus kind of predatory and displacement-oriented gentrification. Um, and I think if what we're really trying to do is to provide the kind of public benefits to these neighborhoods that we're talking about in this program, we have to be very mindful of any uh, effects on the single family market and anything we do that makes it far easier to deploy these properties as rental rather than home ownership um, and anything that undermines the requirement to properly rehab these properties. Uh, it is a little known fact that um, most vacant single family residential properties are not um, so-called zombie foreclosures stuck in the foreclosure process. That only accounts for maybe 2% of them. The rest are investor held properties. Sometimes they're rented out um, sometimes they're just sitting vacant. So I'm going to talk about two specific things related to your uh, to the rule. Um, and again, I apologize that this really isn't an area where I'm a subject matter expert. First, vacancy. A number of folks have addressed this today, and I'm going to address it as someone who is dealing with vacant properties every single day. The first thing is we need a definition of vacancy. Um, we have problems all the time in the work we do because of the multiple definitions of vacancy out there. The census, the United States Postal Service, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, pretty much every municipality and pretty much every other lender out there has a different definition of vacancy. Um, and this can cause a lot of problems, especially when it comes to property preservation and maintenance. And it certainly could cause problems with respect to basing an exemption um, of substantial improvement on vacancy. Um, another terminology uh, topic that I want to cover is the term land banking. Um, you've used that term uh, with respect to unimproved land to mean kind of the you know, acquisition of land with sort of no intention to do anything in particular. I do want to note that land banking has really uh, become a term of art in the last decade with the municipal land banking movement. Uh, land banking is now really a, a process or policy by which local governments acquire surplus properties and convert them to productive use or hold them for long-term strategic purposes. This is a, a public purpose organization and we, would, we don't really want to see the term land banking associated with a behavior that we're more likely to describe as 
warehousing or even squatting or you know what, whatever. So I, I just wanted to make that point. Um, in terms of the number of years a property should be vacant before it's eligible for the exemption. If the property, every, everybody has already made this point, there is nothing worse for a community than a vacant property, nothing. Um, you know, the, the problems that come along with vacancy are legion. So for a property that was vacant prior to the Opportunity Zones program, I don't see any need for any period at all. That property should be able to be put back into productive use. Similarly, in the single family context, and only in the single family context, after a property goes through foreclosure, it should be able to be eligible immediately. Um, on the other hand, since what we have in many of these neighborhoods are hundreds, thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands collectively, uh, single family homes held by investors that have done nothing to improve these properties and really have just become slumlords. Um, these are investors who will have absolutely no qualms about kicking out their tenant so they can sit around and wait for a period of years before they get the exemption. Um, I'm a little concerned that the five years is both too long and too short. It is to, you don't ever want to say out loud in a reg that something should be vacant for five years for any purpose, because vacancy for five years is just frankly a disaster. Um, it may be that, again, I can only speak for single family and I, the situation is very different for apartment buildings, for larger buildings, that if you have a vacant property, or if you have a property that's um, being rented out like that, it is highly likely it is in need of the kind of investment where you really want to see substantial improvement in that property and you may not want to exempt it at all so again just for single family i'm going to put that out there um, the last thing i'm going to say because um, this is not my area of expertise is we would like to see these funds to be able to be used for for sale development um, you've already put you know you have the 12 month um, recycling ability now, but that doesn't necessarily cover all of the other taxable events that occur if you're running a business that's rehabbing and selling single family residential properties. We would suggest that there be, that you consider having a section of the reg that specifically addresses single family. Um, because lots of these issues, you're kind of putting a you know, square peg in a round hole when you're trying to talk about either vacancy or reinvestment periods or the, the amount of time it takes either to deploy capital to, or to actually do the rehab, completely different for single family than for multifamily. So um, I don't, you know, I would be happy to work with you on that as well. Um, I'm running out of time, but uh, I, did, I did wait a long day so i will I, I will just my my last point is i just want to underscore what everybody said about the importance of data collection um I, you know i have data that i've collected on twenty six thousand properties from hundreds of different single family developers uh it has been an enormously useful database for developing other statutory and other proposals related to single family it is imperative that, that you collect, assemble, track, and disclose this at least some minimum set of data. I agree that, that the CDFI fund may be the uh, appropriate um, uh, entity with the capacity to do this, and they could probably do it with information that is largely already being collected by the funds and just needs to be reported. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Just one. Uh, which definition of vacancy for vacant do you recommend that we adopt? Since you said that there are several and, and uh, that leads to confusion. So I, I'll be honest with you, it doesn't matter that much. You just have to have a definition. Um, the Postal Service definition is very expansive and includes vacancy you know you might you might be as and this is true for the census too it might be vacant because somebody is on vacation or in some kind of long-term medical care situation 
So it has to be a vacancy definition that's um, really oriented toward what we're thinking of right now as vacancy when we talk about it. Um, you know, I always think the, the Fannie and Freddie definitions are good ones um, because they really cover so much of the industry. But um, again, what matters more is to have an agreed upon definition than particularly which one it is. All right, thank you very much. All right, thanks so much for your comments. So uh, this concludes the formal presentation. Uh, what we usually do in public hearings is we allow anybody else who wants to speak or has anything to say to they can say it now. Including one of the officers. <laughs> Um, so as Mike just mentioned, um, my name is Shay Hawkins. I was one of the um, drafters of the Opportunity Zone uh, provision and tax reform that um, was based on the Bipartisan Investing in Opportunity Act, uh, which brought us all here today. Um, I'm here today in my capacity as President and CEO of the Opportunity Funds Association. Um, we work with funds, investors, and uh, entrepreneurs to um, advocate for reasonable expansions, um, the ultimate extension and preservation of the Opportunity Zone provision. And um, you know, in my former role, um, I had a good view towards congressional intent behind the program. And the intent was to get um, as much capital into the 8,700 distressed census tracts as possible and to have as many um, investors and a range of different types of investors, uh, as many entrepreneurs, a broad range of entrepreneurs, uh, able to utilize this policy and benefit from it uh, as possible. So we want that 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 far-reaching, far-ranging utilization uh, was really key uh, to congressional intent on this. And so, uh, as an example. Um, you know, there, there are many that have been brought up today. Um, our association, um, just like the other 200 people in the room, we're all part of EIG's coalition. <laughs> so we, um, so, so, so we echo a lot of what's been mentioned today. But I want to emphasize, just as, a, as an example, the, um, you know, the um, aggregation versus the asset by asset. Um, substantial improvement, uh, you know, standard. Uh, you know, I think that's a great example of, um, you know, if, if we if we hold to the aggregation standard, that'll bring in that broader range of entrepreneur, the broader range of business types that can that can utilize the policy, and a broader range of investors, frankly, that can ultimately get involved. Uh, and so, I'd like to hold that out as an example. And finally. Um, you know, I just like to thank uh, you know Julie and Mike and and, and, and your teams. Uh, I'd like to thank you for everything you guys have done um, in terms of implementation thus far. Uh, but then um, even beyond that, I want to just express appreciation. The past hearing in February and this hearing are both an example of how seriously you take this process, how seriously you take this critical critical policy. And how seriously you take those of us uh, who've taken the time to come here and testify today. So I just want to express our appreciation. And uh, and and anything you need from our association, anything you need from the rest of us in this room, just let us know because we are here to make sure this policy works for the American people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, I'm loud enough. No, because they're, they're, they're recording and they're oh, okay. yeah, all sorts of All right. Hello, my name is Ed Lauren, and I just want to emphasize one thing that I got involved in the EIG and the Novogratic Coalition for one reason. I'm primarily a rehabber of apartments, trying to take light and make light. The problem with this legislation from, the, from day one is that this 100% test is going to do the opposite of what I believe this legislation was intended to do. 
if we can do what Clayton suggested, if we're gonna change the use, and I got this idea over a dinner with Forrest, so this is something I've been noodling over and, and trying to figure out how to make this work for almost a year and a half. If we can change, take the same regulation interpretation of a change of use from vacant to operational, and take that change of use from an unrestricted property to a restricted property with some form of Laura, which has to be off the shelf because it's not so easy to come up with a template to create affordable housing. But there's millions and millions of units that are gonna to continue to atrophy as brand new buildings are built next door because of the way this legislation is set up. So I strongly beg you to please consider a change of use from non-restricted to restricted affordable housing so we can take those millions of units that are getting atrophied and transform them into good product. Because if you can buy it, let's say in a major urban area at 200 a door and you're building at 500 a door, what makes more sense? Well, it all makes more sense, but we still need to preserve that existing percent. If you change the use from non-restricted to restricted affordable housing, and you spend 20% of the capital on renovations, that should suffice as a safe harbor for affordable housing. Let's take the example of in DC. You can buy something for, let's say, 200 a door, old product. The best case scenario is 40 a door is going to be the equivalent of your appraisal in your land. So now you're stuck with 160 a door. So 20% of that would be 32,000 a door. Very significant renovation. But certainly you're never gonna spend 160 a door, never. And that property will sit there and over the years will atrophy and become more blighted because there's no incentive to react. So sorry to bang this drum so hard, but I think it's critical that people realize this legislation may backfire for that very reason. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ashley Harrington. I'm the Director of Social Justice at UNCF, the United Negro College Fund. We are the largest provider of scholar, private provider of scholarships in this country, and we also represent 37 of the private historically black colleges and universities in this country. But we got into this discussion and we're interested in this work because half of our institutions are located in opportunity zones. And these are institutions that have been historically underfunded and, and not invested at the level that they should be. And so if you're thinking about ways of encouraging um, businesses to work not just with minority women owned businesses, we also think there should be encouragement to work with our institutions because they are bedrock in their communities. Um, for those who are not familiar with historically black colleges and universities, there are 101 accredited HBCUs, public and private, concentrated in 19 states, the District of Columbia, and the US, and the US Virgin Islands. They enroll almost 300,000 students, approximately 80% of whom are African American, and 70% come from low-income families. Only 10% of undergraduates enrolled at non-HBCUs and we account for only 3% of public and not-for-profit private institutions, but we award 17% of bachelor's degrees to African Americans and 24% of STEM degrees to African Americans. We annually generate over 130,000 jobs in our communities and almost $15 billion in total economic impact. So we think there are excellent ways to invest in their communities and we think there's a reason most of them are in opportunity zones and they are those bedrocks. So if you're wanting to affect the community around an HBCU and in an opportunity zone, you can do that through our institutions. They are usually the largest employer as a, as, and not just the biggest educator. Employer as a, as, and not just the biggest educator. So, thank you. so thinking about that for everyone in this room, but also as you think about how you do that in the regulations. Thank you. What? Thank you. <coughs> what have we done or failed to do that if we did or failed to do that if we did or didn't do, didn't do, would better encourage the results that you're looking for. So I'm also not an expert on this, but um, I think the normal type of incentives that you use to encourage, I think the normal type of incentives that you use to encourage people to partner with certain folks, I think um, extra credits, extra. Uh, we're, we're, we're stuck with a, with a statute. Right. 
they did a wonderful job even in the worst time. Yeah. Um, but but uh, yeah, we that's the that's the the sort of the, the rules of the game that we have to operate in, and clearly so encouraging not just the communities around uh, uh, HBCU, but also uh, encouraging the institutions themselves would be a wonderful good. Mm -hmm. The question, though, is to what extent does this statute give us scope to do that? So I, again, not an expert, and I'm happy to think more about this with you, but one problem that I'll say from the institutional side that we've encountered is that our institutions, because they are often um, so uh, low resourced, right? They are very risk averse. And so much of this process represents a concern because it's new, but also there's potential risk, not just for the investors, but also for the institutions if they're working with the investors. So it's clarifying and thinking about ways to, the statute can not get rid of the risk for everyone, but when you're thinking about HBCUs in particular, how to mitigate that risk because they do offer the public good beyond just um, some other needs, and they are definitely related to poverty reduction and economic growth in their communities. And so I can help, we can, we're happy to help think about more specific ways you can do that in the regulations. Thanks. Anybody else? Uh, I, my name is Ed Mulwark. I'm a Deloitte tax. Um, I, I want to thank the panelists and the speakers for their insightful questions and comments in particular. Um, I was heartened by Mr. Nobody's statement at the outset um, about how we can help Treasury and the IRS in its rulemaking process by focusing comments and regulating on regulations that clarify rather than modify or otherwise supplement or supplant the statutory directives that Congress uh, set forth in 1400Z2. Uh, um, with that in mind, I'd like to address my question and comment to the juxtaposition of the proposed regulations and I use rule with provision in section 1400Z2D3A um, that by its terms defines the range of business activities um, the qualified opportunities on business can engage in, but not those of a qualified opportunity fund. Uh, if it engages in certain businesses directly, for example, um, a golf course or a hot tub facility or a country club um, or a, a liquor store or something of that nature. Um, now, I, I think today um, that, that difference, the difference between the qualified opportunity zone businesses uh, statutory restrictions on the type of quotes in businesses uh, that it's allowed to engage in and the fact that there's no statutory restriction on qualified opportunity funds has been referred to as a loophole of some sort. Um, but you know it's it, it's only one of many, many differences between the rules that apply to Qualified opportunities on businesses, including the substantially all requirement for uh, the, the amount of property that they have to hold, um, which which um, which, which Treasury and the IRS have defined seventy percent, as opposed to the ninety percent requirement uh, that that qualified opportunity funds would have to um, you know have if they invested directly uh, in the qualified opportunity zone, and so. Um, there is um, there is this difference in the statute, and it seems to be reflected, uh, unless I'm mistaken, in the proposed regulations, which restrict the sin business um, rules under 144C6B uh, to the part of the regulations that deals with qualified opportunities on businesses. However, um, a, a number of um, you know. Hotel chains, um, resorts, um, and you know, obviously, you know, taxpayers who would otherwise engage in one of the enumerated types of businesses are, are concerned that um, 
that the anti-abuse provision could be used uh, even though there's no restriction in the statute of regulations against what, what would seem to be a fairly straightforward application where a qualified opportunity fund engages directly in, for example, the management of a golf course. Um, and so, you know, the question is uh, whether um, you consider it abusive um, for, for an opportunity fund to engage directly in the you know, acquisition, maybe even substantial improvement, or development of a new, let's just keep it with golf course, uh, whether that could be qualified opportunities and property in the hands of that qualified opportunity fund. Um, and sort of as an, as an ancillary issue, which, which sort of applies just to the qualified opportunities and business, whether you would consider applying a rule similar to the one in notice 2006-67 for uh, golf opportunity zones where there's a 10% um, uh, where there's a 10% prohibited um, you know, business safe harbor whereby if your gross receipts are under 10%, you, you wouldn't have to, um, you know, you wouldn't be disqualified. So for example, a massage, you know, a, a physical therapist uh, that also engages in massages, um, you know, or, or a rehabilitation center or something of that nature. Um, so those are kind of the three questions. No, I mean, we appreciate your comments. I would suggest writing them in a comment letter to us. I, I think the New York State Bar Association has. Uh, yeah, I, I, the sin business question is, is, has been brought up to me a number of times. So it's something that we're actively thinking about. And would you consider including an example in the anti-abuse regulations one way or the other? And we will definitely think about it. Thank you. Okay, anybody? As a matter of rank drafting, uh, examples are nice, but if there's a clean rule that we could articulate, that would be better. Yeah. Well, I think that's where the 10% prohibited, uh, prohibited business rule under the, you know, the notice 2006-67 is, is useful. Was that part of the New York Bar comment? Uh, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll write it out separately in an article, thanks. All right. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? All right then, on behalf of the panel, we thank you very much for all your comments thank and you, suggestions. Guys. And this concludes hearing for investing in opportunity zone funds, reg number 120186. Thank you. Thank you.